From Staples Center in Los Angeles, Tom Yamas. Welcome to ABC News Live. Special coverage of the Kobe Bryant Memorial celebrating a legend. More than 250,000 fans have passed through the Staples Center where we are right now to honor the NBA great. Today, 20,000 ticket holders, a sold out event, will gather in the house that Kobe built. And I invite you to look at your calendar right now. February 24th, 2020, 2 24 2020, a symbolic date for Kobe's wife, Vanessa Bryant. Two representative of her daughter, Gianna, who also died and wore that number when she played basketball and 24 one of Kobe's numbers on the Lakers then 2020 20 years on the Lakers 20 years married to Vanessa the atmosphere is somber out here and, and to be honest it, it is a little sad but it's also electrifying to see what Kobe meant to this community the details of this ceremony are still a secret we have no idea what to expect today but like Kobe Bryant's play we are expecting something special you're looking live at an overhead shot right now of the Staples Center the place Kobe Bryant helped make legendary thousands are arriving today to say goodbye and to pay tribute to Kobe, the NBA All-Star and five-time world champion, who along with his 13-year-old daughter Gianna and seven others were killed in a helicopter crash just last month. Today, Los Angeles is mourning and celebrating the lives of all of those lost as the investigation into this crash continues. Since his death, tributes have popped up all over the world, showing the impact he had not only on this game, but as a father. After leaving professional basketball, the superstar did not slow down, coaching his daughter's team, writing children's books, and making a documentary about the game he loved that won him an Oscar. Joining me now with more on Kobe's legacy, my ESPN colleague and host of The Jump, Rachel Nichols. And Rachel, I, I know this has got to be a tough day for you because as your career got started, so did Kobe Bryant's, and, and you spent a lot of that career covering him. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Kobe came onto the scene as a high schooler. He wasn't loved by a lot of the people ahead of him in the NBA. It was an interesting dynamic. We think of Kobe now as the statesman, this presence, right. part of the NBA fabric. But at that point, a lot of people in the league thought of him as this punk kid who thought he could do everything. And there was some pushback here on the Lakers, hazing his rookie year. People who thought, you know, they used to have beer in the locker room here after games, but he was 18 years old. So they couldn't have beer in the room when Kobe Bryant was there. So they thought, Kobe Bryant's responsible for taking our beer away. I mean, it was sometimes as, as specific as that. So he didn't have the easiest entry. And that was during my time early as a reporter. I was young female covering sports at a time where it wasn't as accepted as as fortunately it is today and I remember times where people wouldn't talk to me things that real hard time with stories and I came here to do a story on Kobe Bryant and frankly I expected him to kind of be the same to brush me off to not really give me any time and he sat down with me for 45 minutes and we sat on a bench and I will remember it like it was yesterday we just talked and he was very open about the experiences he was having here the tough time during his first year in the league and at the end of it I was telling him a little bit about me and what was hard for me and he looked at me and he just said, he's like, you know what? We're going to be okay. And he said, they don't know what's coming. And I've repeated that story so many times over the years because it speaks to this amazing confidence he had that he knew what he could do and it was going to come through. And boy, in his case, wasn't it true? We didn't know what was coming. All right, he evolved as a player and as a man. And he was able to have a career outside of basketball. Some have said this was, the day that he passed away was the saddest day in the history of the NBA. How has it impacted the game this season and you think going forward? Look, it is part of everything. Um, you know, every game for a week or two after Kobe's passing wasn't even really about basketball. It was about Kobe. And there's so many games now that are still like that. The Lakers are in such a weird position for the rest of this season because they go into other cities as visitors on the road. And teams want to use that as a time to have their Kobe tribute. So the Lakers have been part of multiple, multiple Kobe tributes around the league for weeks and weeks, sort of emotionally being drawn back into this. We had the All-Star game that was completely dedicated to Kobe. In fact, the two teams, instead of the players wearing their own numbers, they wore number 24 for Kobe and number two for his daughter Gianna. We expect this NBA Finals to be a lot about Kobe. And then Kobe was scheduled to be up for induction into the Hall of Fame right. this fall, which is sort of just staggering when you think of how close he missed it, that we're never going to hear that speech. So they have nominated him posthum posthumously. Yeah. He is expected to be enshrined there, right. but that will also be about Kobe this fall. So it is just such a presence looming over the entire league, the sport, and of course the city. Finally, Rachel, you know, we don't know what to expect today. We, we do think it's going to be something special. Kobe deserves that. And there's so many people who loved him inside this league, in this city, all over the world. What are you going to be thinking about?
about as, as you watch the ceremony today? I just think that power he had to affect so many different kinds of people's lives. We expect some pretty heavy hitter speakers today, pretty heavy hitter performers, and it just speaks to how many different people from different walks of life felt that Kobe was theirs. I mean, you really can't think of Los Angeles for the last two decades without thinking about Kobe Bryant. Is there a person that you would think of specifically eh, acting Hollywood? Well, that's a sign, right? It's Kobe that wore that name across his chest. So you can't talk about LA without talking about Kobe. And you can't talk about the fabric of really this country without talking about Kobe for the last two decades. He was just kind of always there for so many different people. And I think that's what we're going to see today. All right, Rachel Nichols, we thank you so much for that. And we'll be thank thinking you. about you today as we watch the coverage as well. Post NBA Live, Kobe Bryant enjoyed being a coach and coaching his daughter's basketball team. He really felt sports was an analogy for life. Here he is in his own words talking about his coaching and parenting philosophy. The way I share my knowledge of the game with my team in particular is just through experience. I don't spend a lot of time talking to them about stories or the value of hard work. We just simply live it, we embody it, and then it becomes something that just they just grow up accustomed to. You know, the respect for the game, the respect for each other. I mean, these are things that we just do. And uh, through doing that, it becomes something that uh, eventually becomes a part of who they are as athletes and young people. And uh, for us as coaches and as parents, it's our job to try to spark that imagination within our children. Oh. <laughs> Instead of you know putting her under a structure and saying, okay, you gotta make this amount of shots or that amount of shots, just go out and have fun with them. Right? Just be imaginative. You know, say, get, you know, give her the ball and say, listen, you got 10 seconds left. I'll count down from 10, you know, hit a game-winning shot. Uh, things like that, I, I think it's uh, it's extremely important. You know, what we're here to do is to help children be better, to teach them how to think the game, to teach them how to process the game, to help them get better as athletes uh, so they can feel more uh, confident about themselves as people. That's what we're there for, and it's important to find a coach that understands that, that understands the connectivity between life and sport. Sport is the greatest metaphor that we have for life, and it's important that we treat it as such. So Kobe Bryant, they're showing that there was life after basketball. It's something he worked hard at. He did have a second act. He was possibly working on a third act as well. Joining me now is co-host of ESPN's First Take, Stephen A. Smith. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. Um, you, you knew Kobe, Kobe. You covered him. He was a friend. What's going to be going through your mind today as you watch the ceremony? Just incredible sadness again, um, you know, knowing him and knowing how much he was looking forward to the future, knowing all that he had already accomplished, the championship the all-star appearances, the league MVPs, two Olympic gold medals, all of that stuff. It was all behind him. He had done it. He had conquered every demon that, you know, real and imagined. And his mentality was, I'm 41 years of age. I've got a wonderful wife. I've got wonderful children, a wonderful family, and I've got my whole life to look forward to. And the only expectations that I have to concern myself with are those that I put on my shoulders because I've already conquered what everybody else has placed on me. And so that was his mentality. Uh, the last time I saw him, which was New Year's Eve, that's what we talked about. And I knew what he was looking forward to. And just to know, to be here now, uh, more than a month later, to know that he's gone, it's, it's pretty devastating. You know, explain something to our viewers. A lot of people who are watching us all over the world today are sports fans. They were Kobe fans. But there are also people who may not understand why so many people have come out here. 250,000 since he died. 20,000 a sold-out stadium here. I've covered a lot of events. I covered Michael Jackson's death and, and other famous people's death. I don't know if I seen anything like this in a mourning period for as long. What did he mean? It was more than basketball. Well, it was more than basketball, and obviously to the basketball community, it was about that just as much as it was about anything else, because no matter what great level of greatness you have inside of you and what you exude off the court, the first order of business to athletes and the people within the profession is to handle your business on the court. He clearly did that with the, with the success that he had, but then he also stepped back and reached back to help guys in terms of their off-the-court endeavors uh, some of the aspirations that they may have had, what it would take to order in order for them to achieve their goals. I remember when he went to the Beijing Olympics in 2008, you see a lot of these guys speaking about branding and about elevating themselves above the court and really solidifying a future for themselves that extended beyond the court of play. He constantly talked to them about that, was always willing to give guidance and support. Plus, he would train with some of them in the offseason or train them and talk to them about, talk to them about the ins and outs of what it takes to be 
successful. And a lot of guys realized he was a willing teacher, a willing mentor. He was somebody that felt it was his mission to give back and to assist in making the world a better place. And then when you see, particularly in this day and age, how he was a girl dad and how he loved women's sports, particularly the WNBA. His daughter talked about being a star and becoming an All-American at UConn before she was ultimately hell-bent on going to the WNBA. And the way he embraced that and was willing to tutor her and so many young, other young ladies to sort of ascend uh, to, a, to a, a land that people thought was designated for just the guys. He was like, no, not at all. This is my legacy, and I love every moment of it. And so when you hear those kind of stories and you see evidence that he was actually living it, not just talking about it, it just makes it that much more painful that at age 41, as brilliant as he was, speaking six different languages, uh, being as intelligent and as accomplished as he was, for him to have his whole life ahead of him and for it to be gone at age 41, it's just tragic. Stephen, finally, on, the, on that point, you, you talked about sort of how he's a renaissance man. He was also incredibly disciplined. He would go out with players, but then he'd wake them up at 5 a.m., he would say, to make sure they were there practicing with him. Do you remember any stories of, of just his discipline, how he, he's constantly lived a life that was always hard work? There's no particular story. It was his life. Um, he was a guy that, you know, you have a lot of people, a vast majority of the NBA, their season ends in mid-April. Because of the success that he enjoyed, it customarily ended in late May and, mo and, and a lot of times June because he went to seven NBA finals. He won five. That was his life. And so you've got guys that literally would have their season end in April and they'd start training in the off season in the summertime or whatever and they get in their workouts. Kobe Bryant would take a week, two weeks off max even when he won the championship and would be out there training and preparing himself for the next season, the next conquest because he knew he was the marquee. He knew people were going to come after him and he knew that he needed to be ready to live up to that. But it was also applicable to everything he did. He's called me on several occasions. What the hell are you still doing to sleep? Why are you not up? You know, if I was sick, you know, he'd call or text me, why the hell ain't you on TV? You got a job to do. If that was me, you wouldn't accept that. Get your behind up, get ready to work. Even he wanted to, you at the top of your game. Even yeah. today, as we sit up here and we talk, you know, in the Staples Center's the backdrop, getting ready to celebrate the life of Kobe Bryant, I remember I was just telling my sister just the other day, Kobe would be like, where the hell you think you're going? You ain't going inside there. You need to be on TV. That's what people expect. You got a job to do. Do your job. Yeah. He was very, very, very big on that. That's what I remember. All right, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. We'll thank be you. thinking about you throughout the ceremony. Thank you. Stephen A. Smith. And earlier today, I spoke with ESPN senior writer Ramona Shelburne about the legacy that Kobe leaves in the NBA. Ramona, you, you covered Kobe Bryant. Uh, we, we spoke the night that this happened. What, what does today mean for you? Well, look, it's been a month since he passed away, and it's, it's just as shocking today as it was a month ago, right? Like, I still remember where I was, how I heard, who I called. I, I remember calling you on the phone. Doesn't that feel like yesterday? It does. I mean, I was driving from the crash site to the Mamba Academy out there in Thousand Oaks, um, and, I, you know, I kind of, it's like I know how to get there, but I had to, like, put it in ways because I, my brain was so, like, overloaded by the shock of this. And so I think today is really a day that this starts to feel real starts to feel like there's some acceptance that can happen. Um, we've all done a lot of processing and you know I know you know I was here the whole first week and it was you know, like my family is Jewish right and when somebody in, in our religion dies like you sit Shiva for them you, you you spend a week and you just get around with your family and friends and you share stories and you talk about them that's what Los Angeles has been doing for a month and that's what the world has been doing for a month um, but that whole first week here man it was it was like a bubble that that we couldn't really get out of um, this whole plaza was 250,000 people came through this plaza. They packed up all the stuff to give it to the Bryant family. It took 37 boxes of shipping containers to fill it all up. I mean, it's the, the, the magnitude of the grief that is felt in this city is enormous. And I think today will be helpful to people in a, in a way of contextualizing it, giving people some peace and some acceptance. You know, Ramona, tens of thousands of people came out here to the Staples Center after this happened. Yeah. 20,000 coming today. They blocked off all the streets around the Staples Center, but we've been driving around. We've been yeah. seeing people in the Lakers gear yep. decorating their cars uh, with Kobe memorabilia. Yeah. Uh, it's I don't want to say it's strange because you know we know how big sports yeah. are, but it sort of transcends sports in a way, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, man. I mean, I was, I was talking to this guy Lee Zeidman. He runs he runs AG. He runs Staples Center. And before they set this up, they they kind of 
studied other similar events. And he goes, there's, there's really no other similar event. He goes, the, the, the closest thing that they could find was when Princess Di died. And, um, you know, there was like 300,000 people around the streets of London when, when she was laid to rest. Um, I, I think that no venue they found would have been big enough. I think there's so many people in Los Angeles around the world that want to be here um, that you could have filled the Coliseum, you could have filled the Rose Bowl, you could have filled all the streets, you could have filled Staples Center, the Forum, uh, any venue you name in Los Angeles, you could have filled it. And, um, you know, they had to make a decision about where it should be. And Staples Center, the, this, this is the house that Kobe built, right? This is last time I was here with him, his jerseys were getting retired. And, the, you know, the time before that, it was when he scored 60 points in his last game. It's perfect. Um, I wish everybody could be here because I think, you know, that's what people want to do. Um, but I'm glad that it's that it's going to be, you know, broadcast everywhere. I, I don't think many people are going to be at work today, huh? All right. Especially you're not here. Uh, finally, Ramona, can you remember your, your last conversation with him and, and what you guys talked about? Yeah, um, I actually saw him uh, out at the Mamba Academy, and uh, he was doing an event with young girls, and uh, it, you know, just just the way he talked to him. Then we just we just caught up, right? Like I just had my son; he was a uh, few months old, no, maybe six, seven months old at that point. Um, I was showing him baby pictures. He was showing me pictures of his girls, right? And he was so proud of his his girls. Not just not just Gigi, okay, Natalia, Bianca, Capri, like they like he was just we were just two parents showing each other's pictures um, and that's what I think is the hardest part right now is um, like for me like I'm 40 he was, he was 41 like we kind of grew up together you know I, I remember when he took Brandy to the prom right like yeah. I, I was in high school when that happened and uh, so it's, it's like you see somebody who has the same kind of trajectory in your life and, and you know, I waited later in life to have children of my own um, and it was like I, I enjoy my it's like I you can't imagine life before it and I feel like Kobe kind of waited later in his life to, to enjoy that family that he had built right like that he had created um he was so happy when i last saw him and um so i, I think that's what i'm gonna hold on to is just just knowing like he he had a lot more to do he had a lot more to say but he was happy my conversation earlier today with Ramona Shelburne from ESPN. Joining me now with more on what we can expect in today's service is my colleague TJ Holmes. Now, TJ, I, I, I say that, but we, we really don't know what to expect today. They have kept this thing very close to the chest, and why not, right? Don't don't get so much out there. They were able to control the narrative, and actually, everybody's going to be surprised to a certain degree to see what we see in here. But of course, all eyes are on Vanessa Bryant. Is she going to show up? If she does, is she going to speak? Will the kids be there? Will they take the stage? People are just looking to embrace them in a major way. She has not made a public appearance since the accident, since that crash a month ago, put out some statements on Instagram, but everybody is just really wanting to embrace her, but wanting to see if she if she shows up today. All eyes will be on that. What we do know, though, is there's some some, some symbolism, symbolism between on the ticket prices and also the yeah. date of today. It was kind of cool how they did this, right? February 24th, 2020. That's yeah. 2 24 2020. 2 was the number Gianna wore. Uh, 24, of course, the number that Kobe spent the last 10 years of his career in and then 20 he spent 20 years with the Lakers so symbolism there all the tickets were 2402 and or 224 dollars yeah. so yeah symbolism and numbers everything today and I know you saw and you've been standing out here but all of downtown Los Angeles has been kind of a memorial since the accident right I was I was here that whole week and purple lights buildings lit up in his name but today everyone is surrounded this place it looks like everybody's giving downtown and Staples Center yeah. some kind of collective hug almost right. just in all the jerseys it look like they're here for a game almost right people wearing their uniforms wearing their Kobe Bryant jerseys but uh, um, it's supposed to be a celebration today yeah, so. and, and we actually are just getting our first images inside the Staples mm. Center right now we have a monitor over here TJ I want you to take a look at and you and, and it is kind of what you said it is a collective hug yeah. around the city of Los Angeles today uh, when I came out here it was somber it, it's sad but it is electrifying to see the people wear the Kobe gear to be excited to show their support and we saw that every time we came out here I mean the memorials were huge uh, Ramona was just telling me it was 37 trucks loads of wow. memorabilia they filled that, that that surrounded the Staples Center in honor of Kobe Bryant and and I've sort of been saying this all morning but he did transcend sports he's somebody who he played here but people came to watch him because they could forget about their lives for a little bit they could forget about whatever stress and Kobe a champion was gonna win for them he put on a show every single night he understood that we have to remember now these huge personalities and these huge talents Michael Jordan LeBron James right they, they hold these places yeah. but right in between those two that era was owned by Kobe 
Kobe Bryant. It's not just because of his talent, but his charisma, that smile, how he could market himself around the world, really. And that's what people were drawn. The talent is one thing. It speaks for itself. But it speaks for itself. But to your point, yes, he was so much bigger than this game and was getting bigger in some ways, yeah. it seems, after his playing career. We always keep talking about the Oscar, but he was a best-selling author. He had the Mamba Foundation, what he was doing with women's sports. He just seemed like he was almost just getting started, even though we've been watching him for 20 years in his career. And we were just talking uh, during the last piece that you said that you had a chance to interview him back in 2016. Yeah. You remember that last conversation you had with him? I do. We were. He was being honored at the ESPYs. Um, and I was talking to him afterwards, and the, I wrapped up with this. I said, yeah, your, your wife now, she's pregnant with you guys third. He said, I said, yeah, third girl. I said, man, what's going on with you? Somebody punishing you? You got three girls running. <laughs> and he said, man, daddy's girls. He just lit up and said it several times. Yeah. Daddy's girls, daddy's girls. And then he said, well, they're all going to play soccer, was what he yeah, said. Yeah. But he was just so excited, and he lit up in a way that you can't fake. Yeah. And you saw it as soon as you started talking about those girls, daddy's girls. And now, of course, one of his girls being celebrated here with him today. Right. All eyes waiting to see if his, uh, if his family is going to show up, his wife and those three daughters. Of yeah. His yeah. No, that is a big part of that. And actually leads us to our next segment now with Kenna Whitworth. TJ, thanks Good so much. You, yeah, the death of Kobe Bryant and his daughter, along with seven others, was shocking, mostly for his wife, Vanessa Bryant. Kenna Whitworth joins me now with how she's been dealing with this tragedy. And Kenna, we were talking about this before we started this broadcast today because it is a major part of what happened here. You can't stop and not think about Vanessa Bryant. She's now raising those other daughters by herself. She lost one of her daughters and her husband, and, and those Instagram posts have been so emotional to read. Yeah, Tom, of course, we are both parents, and that was something that struck us as well, is how is Vanessa doing? Today is about honoring Kobe and Gigi, of course, but our hearts go out to Vanessa and her three daughters. And when she first posted on Instagram, she said that she was really hesitant to do so. She was hesitant to put her feelings out there, but that she decided to write about it in case somebody else might be going through something similar. She wanted to see if she could help anybody out there when she started to express her feelings and she said in her Instagram post that it's like she just can't come to terms with her body will not allow her to realize that they are gone and that she's trying to process the death and the loss of Kobe she said my body just will not let me understand that my Gigi will never come back to me it's not fair she also said I'm so mad and how can you not relate to that? And then she went on to say that she had to be there, of course, for her three daughters, to raise her three daughters. And on Valentine's Day, she posted a picture of her and Kobe. She called him her forever Valentine. She also said that apparently Valentine's Day was his favorite holiday, something that you might not think or might not, of course, know about Kobe Bryant. And most recently, she posted a picture of a tattoo. It's a tattoo on World Cup cup champ Sydney LaRue and it's the number two. Now that of course is Gigi's number but that is also the number that Sydney wears as well and Tom the theme of tattoos is running strong. I, I read a report that there's even a tattoo artist here in Los Angeles who is booked through the end of the year. That is something that people are doing to honor Kobe. People are mourning in all different ways and we can only imagine how Vanessa feels today. Our hearts go out to her as she tries to move on with her life, raise her girls. Of course, Tom, they have a seven-month-old. They have a baby girl who will not really, uh, you know, know her father the way that many of us do. And it's certainly hard to think about because at the end of the day, there is a mom who lost her baby and lost her husband, and she has to figure out how to move on. No, you're, you're so right, Kana, and, and we, we don't even know if Vanessa Bryant will be here, and you and I were speaking about this, and, and that's okay if she if she's not here, because this is the, maybe the lowest point, without a doubt, in her life, and yet she still has to show strength. She still has to be that mom to that baby, to her two other daughters, and sort of the symbol now, um, really the head of the household now, for the Bryant family, and, and fans and people who love Kobe Bryant will be looking at her and sort of reading how she deals with this morning, and, and and in a lot of ways, people are going to be looking up to her, too. Yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. I think people will look to Vanessa on how to move forward. Where do you go from here? I mean, people in Los Angeles don't know Los Angeles without Kobe Bryant, and she has been a part of his story from the beginning. I mean, they started dating when she was in high school in Orange County, and she was with him his entire NBA rise. She stood by him when times were tough in their marriage, and they, of course, had the four beautiful daughters, and they made Kobe Bryant, as he likes to say, a girl dad. And I think that she will set the precedence here on how we're all supposed to feel when we think about what to do and where to move forward. And she, we're learning, Tom, as as this is coming on the heels here, that the FAA is saying five years ago that pilot who was piloting that doomed helicopter uh, was involved in an airspace violation during a cloudy day uh, at LAX. And we're learning now today that on February 24th, Vanessa Bryant has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Island Express, against that helicopter company. TMZ says she is claiming that the pilot was reckless. Yeah, Kana Whitworth, that, that news just breaking right now. Uh, unfortunately, on the same day that, that people are coming here to, to honor Kobe Bryant and her daughter Gianna, you did mention the, the word girl's dad, and that sort of was a news story, something that came out of this horrible tragedy. Shortly after Kobe and Gianna's death, the hashtag girl dad went viral. ESPN's Ellie Duncan shows us how Kobe Bryant was not only an inspiration to many as a player, but also as a father of girls. Girl dad is obviously a dad that has a daughter, but I think it's deeper than that. I think your love for her is just so strong, and you just uh, get all mushy inside when, when you see her. To be the father of, of girls, um, it means everything. I love my, love my girls so much, and each one, you can already see their different personalities, and it definitely makes me feel special. Couldn't be happier to be a girl dad. In the wake of his death, the words Kobe Bryant shared with me almost two years ago have now created a movement. And without hesitation, he said, I would have five more girls if I could. I'm a girl dad. Being able to just be with his daughters, be with his family, it's like the happiest I've ever seen him. Now all y'all see a girl dad, now it's a new hashtag. You, you quite understand that. With two simple words, the world found a way to pay tribute to the legend through their daughters. The fact that something like that has, has gotten trending and I think the fact that the whole world kind of stopped when the tragedy happened, it just shows how much of an impact he had, not only on, on you know athletes, but on everyone across the world. And that's very powerful. Thousands upon thousands of fathers honoring their daughters and daughters celebrating their dads. A simple phrase for a sacred bond. Kobe impacted me as a girl dad by just showing that girls can do the same thing guys can do. They can have the same mindset. It seemed like he loved everything with so much passion and I'm sure that came from having all girls. And so I'm trying to grow into that, that type of love for my family as well. Kobe set the example of how to be a dad of girls and to inspire confidence in them and showing them that they can be and do anything that they want. The moments that I get to spend with Bernie before the games are moments I'll remember forever. She likes to just talk about, when are we going to the game so I can go out there and dribble with you on the court, Dad? She loves it, she lights up, and certainly lights me up. You see, there's a perception that having boys makes men feel more complete. But there was Kobe, in all his joy, reminding the world of the blessing that comes with being a dad to girls. My wife is actually pregnant, and so we're expecting our fourth, and I've been getting a lot of people saying, what if it's another girl? As much as I would love a boy, as much as my wife would love a boy, there's, there's definitely a part of me that hopes it's another girl. From pros to average Joes to the daughters of giants, a community was forged. I think the overall impact has been everything. I mean, I think dads in general have become better, it seems. We're proud to have our girls, and we're not just so, oh, I want a boy, I want a boy. I think we're embracing the girls and knowing that they're amazing. You know, Kobe, also, just thank you for being a girl dad. And just thank you for loving Gigi and your, and your other daughters the way you did. It's been a great example for me and, and loving my daughter, Sienna. So thank you, brother.
the story behind the hashtag girls dad. All right, coming up next, a man who faced off against Kobe on the court many times. Bruce Bowen joins us live to discuss his memories of the NBA icon. Stay with us. You are watching ABC News Live continuing coverage of the memorial service for Kobe and Gianna Bryant. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline, ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. And download the app now and sign up to get important breaking news alerts wherever you are. Can you tell us your full name for the record? Jeffrey Edward Epstein. Every girl that meets Jeffrey starts off with giving him a massage. He's like, I'll pay you $200 for every girl that you bring to me. Who else was underage? All of them. All of them. He told me the younger the better. How did he get so rich? How did he get away with it for so long? And what do the women who survived his crimes now have to say? <laughs> Truth and Lies, Jeffrey Epstein. Listen free now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. And back now with more ABC News live coverage of the memorial for Kobe and Gianna Bryant. We are just moments away from the ceremony starting. Just behind me, you can see the crowds of fans that are trying to get into the Staples Center right now. Uh, the ceremony is set to start in just a few minutes. It could, you know, maybe perhaps start a little later than that. But a lot of ticket holders are rushing to the gates right now to get in. Nearly everyone wearing Kobe Bryant gear. Joining us now is ESPN analyst and former NBA player for the San Antonio Spurs, who faced off on the court many times against Kobe. Bruce Bruce Bowen. Bruce, thanks so much for joining us on this day. I, I know your, your heart and your mind is with Kobe and his family today, but I, I do have to ask you, since, since you had the opportunity, unlike maybe anybody else who's watching right now, what was it like to play with Kobe Bryant to try to cover him as a defensive player? Well, it was a joy because he was definitely one of the best. And whenever you get a chance to go up against the best, I think that should, you know, kind of elevate your juices as well to do the best job you can against him. Now, you know, we know all the things that Kobe has accomplished. And, and when we started battling, there was, there was a bit of envy from my behalf as far as he has something that I wanted. And I didn't care for him in the beginning because I thought, oh, look at his swagger. He's so arrogant. But he was a champion. And so so with that being said, it was one play that really earned my respect with Kobe out there on the floor, and it taught me the situation of you got to have a healthy respect for others. You can't discredit them for their accomplishments, but more importantly, work just as hard as they may work, and you may too be a champion. Uh, Bruce, what was it like, I mean, day in and day out, because, you know, we've talked a lot today about Kobe's discipline. Would he come back better and stronger every year? You understood that he was such a, 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 a person that would get after his craft. You understood that he was going to come back each and every year with something different. One year, I remember he came back a little more muscular, and the first thing he did on the post-up, he says, hey, yeah, I've been working out, Bruce. You can tell, huh? I put some extra weight so that when you keep hacking me, I'll be able to finish my shots. 
Oh, Bruce, and um, you know, watching all of this, and and, and I've, I've heard you talk about the moment you learned of the news when, when you had learned that Kobe had passed away. What's it been like for for players who played with Kobe, and and just in the general, you, you're still very much part of the NBA. What's it like been for the league? Well, I think is it, if there's anything we can learn from this is that life is so valuable and we have to really cherish the moments we have with it. You know, learning this news, what it did was I think it showed a, a human aspect for a lot of the players, even in a competitive environment where, you know, you're going up against someone and, and there's a disdain you have. But now, because of the human aspect of it, you see Kobe still impacting the game in a different way, you, you, your heart goes out to he and his family and so when I heard the news it was devastating because this is someone that from the the early times of us, of us battling against one another I, I come to have and develop a relationship with him we would sit and talk and in those talks he talked about growing the game this is one of the greatest players to ever pick up the basketball and he's talking about how we need to help this game how we need to continue the process of teaching the game and so when you see that type of fervor and desire in someone pouring their heart and effort into something as, as simple as a love that they have, it only makes you that much more appreciative of the time that you got to spend with him as well as the others. Uh, Bruce, you, you talked about things we can learn from this experience, and, and what do you think younger players maybe have, have learned about Kobe? Because we have learned so much more about his story, about his life, his passions, and, and what he wanted to do after basketball. I think if there's anything that a lot of the younger players can learn is his desire and his work ethic. It was not about anything being given to Kobe. We talk about an 18-year-old that's playing at the NBA level and, and contributing, you know, in his second year and continue the process of listening to coaches and taking all that knowledge and applying it to others as he got older. You saw the way he's willing to work with guys now. There is a time where Kobe was such a competitor, he didn't want to work out with a player. He wanted to make sure that he he was doing his due diligence so that he could keep that edge. I think his work ethic is something that we all can learn from as far as his hours in the gym, spending time on your craft. You don't just wake up and turn it on like that. A lot of players today are learning that in all these different tributes to Kobe, and I think that's the positive. If there's anything they can learn from him is the fact that if you work hard enough and you have a passion for something, great things will happen. By no means I don't think Kobe ever thought of his legacy quite like this, but it was only because of the person he was and the desire to get better at the game that he loved is why everyone has such emotions for he and his family right now. You know, um, Kobe, when he left the game, also spoke about being a villain and, and being a hero. What was it about him that, that maybe players and opposing fans hated or disliked, or, or how did he get under their skin? Well, I think there's a comfort with self that Kobe had. Any champion, any, any, any individual that you know, there's a comfort they have with self. And if you have that comfort and if you're comfortable within your skin, there's no greater joy than walking into a building and they're screaming different things at you and you're able to silence that crowd. He enjoyed those moments. He worked hard for those moments. Those moments weren't by happenstance. Those moments only took place because of the love that he had for the game of basketball and the fact that he wanted to continue the process of feeding that to Gigi and others as well. All right, Bruce Bowen for us. Bruce, thank you so much for that. We have just received an update on when the ceremony will start. We think we're about maybe 20 to 25 minutes from the ceremony starting here at the Staples Center. Earlier today, I spoke with Dave McMenamin, who covers the Lakers for ESPN, about how the team is dealing with the loss of the Lakers legend, and David actually grew up in the same city as Kobe. We were both from the suburb of Philadelphia, about uh, 20 miles uh, southwest of Philly, and he was a guy originally when he was coming up it was the son of Joe Bryant the Sixers player and it was is he as good as the guys playing in the Catholic League in Philly he was only playing in the suburbs against guys like me and then he came in the NBA and started to prove himself and played the Sixers in 2001 finals and so he wants to rip the hearts out of all the Philadelphia fans and it kind of like soured his legacy there a little bit but as time went on I think the Philadelphia work ethic was appreciated by the fans there and by the end of his career it was 
was a sellout uh, at the Wachovia Center, and the fans totally embraced the Mamba mentality. You know, there was a time, he said, when he was younger, and I don't know if you remember this, but, but he's spoken about this, where when he was 10 years old, he was a horrible basketball player, and by the time he was 14, he was one of the best players in the state. Were people talking about him back then? Oh, absolutely. He came back to the States uh, after spending about years uh, 7 through 13 in Italy, and I played in a summer league and scored zero points the entire summer league, and he felt like he had to build from the ground up, not only in terms of reestablishing himself as a basketball player, but picking up things like slang and being able to relate to these kids, because he'd spent all this time in Europe. He played against my middle school, and my uh, eighth grade coach still has the scorebook of Kobe's middle school beating his team, and Kobe scored 13 of the team's 26 points. Oh my, I just <laughs> have the points right there. That's yes. incredible. Um, you, you wrote a really uh, tough, touching story about when the Lakers found out the news. Um, what was that like to sort of report on that story, to ask those questions, and to find out what that moment was like? Yeah, I mean, it's been about a month now, and obviously uh, there's been raw emotions, and you want to give people time. And But, but some of the guys were starting to open up. Uh, and Danny Green, one of the Lakers guards, hosts a podcast, and he had Phil Handy, one of the coaches, on, and Quinn Cook at a backup guard. And they, over an all-star break, kind of went and shared their memories of the plane ride. And I had to sit down and interview with Anthony Davis. He started to open up about it. And I'm like, there's enough information out there. You start to piece it together. And so this week, I spoke to Frank Vogel, the Lakers coach, spoke to, to LeBron James. And LeBron told me about this moment after they had gotten the news. And they had all, like, fallen asleep, right? They were cross-country flight. Frank Vogel comes into the plane cabin, tells them all what's happening. LeBron gathered them all for a team prayer. And he, I asked him, like, what was going through your mind? He's like, it was just on my mind. It was in my heart. And I felt like in that moment, we needed to be together. And I said, hey, I, you know, no one knows what God's plan is, but um, we are all here together for a reason, and we need to stick together through this tragedy. Right. What, what do you think this has done for the Lakers team? I mean, you cover basketball. This is sort of one of those things that is this bigger than basketball, if you will. How has it affected the Lakers, and you think the league in general? No, the league in general, I mean, Kobe is one of the monoliths that existed in the NBA, and forevermore he will be a bastion of work ethic, a bastion of following your dreams and achieving them, and someone to have uh, a pride in the, the sport of basketball. He promoted it on the, the youth level, on the women's level, international level, um, and so that will always exist. In terms of this Lakers team specifically, they already had a ton of motivation. LeBron James is a motivated guy, playing in year 17, trying to win a championship with a third different franchise after Miami and Cleveland. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe there's a little bit of something in the air where they're saying, you know, there's there's more than just basketball this year. Maybe we got to do it for ourselves, but also for the community of Los Angeles. Maybe, maybe some, some pressure. We saw that yesterday, the Celtics game. They pulled it off. It was an incredible game. ESPN reporter Dave McMiniman for us. He covers the Lakers. We thank him for his time. We are just minutes away from the beginning of a celebration of life for Kobe and Gianna Bryant. Stay with us. You are watching ABC News Live's continuing coverage. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Can you tell us your full name for the record? Jeffrey Edward Epstein. Every girl that meets Jeffrey starts off with giving him a massage. He's like, I'll pay you $200 for every girl that you bring to me. Who else was underage? All of them. All of them. He told me the younger the better. 
how did he get so rich? How did he get away with it for so long? And what do the women who survived his crimes now have to say? <laughs> Truth and Lies, Jeffrey Epstein. Listen free now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Check out this car right here. We actually saw it pulling up as we drove into the Staples Center here in downtown Los Angeles. It, it is completely covered in Kobe memorabilia right there, the purple and gold. Pretty sweet ride. We are here at the Staples Center today when we are just minutes away. This is a live look, aerial view of the Staples Center from the start of a celebration of life for Kobe and Gianna Bryant. Kobe was a huge advocate, as we know, for child athletes, coaching and mentoring not only his own kids, but many others. ESPN's Shelly Smith has more. The impact of Kobe Bryant is felt by so many all over the country. When did you first learn about Kobe Bryant? Since I was born. 10-year-old Soraya Rodriguez goes to school in San Pedro, a small community in southern Los Angeles County. But it's after school she looks forward to the most. I have loved playing basketball since I was five years old. I love basketball because it's a fun sport and like anyone can play it, boys and girls. In retirement, Kobe Bryant wanted to have a global footprint on his business, and he aimed to be a champion of youth sports. In 2017, he partnered with Nike and the Los Angeles Boys and Girls Clubs to create the Mamba League, a youth basketball instructional league for children ages 8 to 10 that has since expanded to New York City. The program's pitch was simple. Come on out, um, Kobe's doing this amazing thing, and you can come play for the Mamba League, and, and it's gonna be so much more available for her. And throughout my life, I've learned a lot of lessons. And what I'm trying to do now is trying to give the youth a head start. When you enter the Mamba League, it was free. It's free for anybody who wants to join, as long as they're um, with the Boys and Girls Club. And they got this awesome gear. I got a backpack, I got a shirt, I got a book, um, a Sharpie. 16-year-old Kumi Tamara, a high school junior, had attended Kobe's youth camp in Santa Barbara and played tournaments at the Mamba Academy in Thousand Oaks. The two developed a friendship. He had patience to make sure that everyone knew what like the science behind the game, why things were happening and why things weren't, or when to do stuff, and when is the appropriate time not to do anything. Kobe was invested in, obviously, in his kids, teaching excellence to them, but he also was a coach. Tom Ferry is the executive director of the Aspen Institute Sports and Society program. Last year, Kobe collaborated with the Aspen Institute's Project Play and ESPN on an initiative called Don't Retire Kid, an effort to increase youth sports participation. In August, he launched the campaign to his 15 million Twitter followers. I'm here to announce my retirement from sports. The pressure that it takes to play at my age is just too much. Tell me about your involvement with Project Play. Well, something I really became passionate about because of their mission of how do you make the game more engaging? How do you enable kids to play? Project Play is a very ambitious idea. Kobe was valuable because after he retires, he's really thinking about his legacy. How do I take what I've learned about excellence and teach it to the next generation? How do we create culture change, systems change in youth sports in this country so more kids have a better experience playing the game? Bryant was the keynote speaker at the 2018 Project Play Summit and spoke out frequently about the problems in youth sports. I think for, for us and how we guide our children you know, through, their, through their day 
days as young athletes, some of it has to do with just protecting that childlike innocence that they have. Kobe knows from being a high performance athlete that you spark a love of game in the kid and you, you listen to them. You understand their social and their emotional lives and what they need to get out of the experience. He used to always tell me that people come and go into your life for a reason and um, things, um, things happen for a reason and at the end, in the end, it's my story to tell. And he's helped me get to this point and meet so many different people. And down the line, I'll have even more stories to tell. I think the most important thing for parents is establishing an element of fun and imagination. It's important for kids to have freedom and have flexibility to create and to imagine and for the game to be fun uh, while teaching fundamentals of the sport. Go ahead, Shavai. Good job. Let's go. Good he was job. able to give voice to the voiceless kids. Uh, and it's such a rare thing and such a precious thing. And that's what I think we're going to miss is Kobe's ability to help children be respected and hopefully deriving all the benefits that come from playing sports. Kobe on three. One, two, three. ESPN's Shelly Smith for us. And we should note that Vanessa Bryan is donating all proceeds of the ticket sales from today's celebration to the Mamba and Mambasita Sports Foundation. I want to bring in again Kena Whitworth, one of our ABC correspondents. And Kena, I want to take you back a few years ago when you were here outside the Staples Center for Kobe's last game. Yeah, Tom, it's almost eerie to look back on it now. Uh, it was an incredible assignment to get at the time. And when you come to the game, it was an otherwise meaningless game, right? There was no playoff implications here, but it might as well have been the NBA Finals. Uh, the atmosphere was unbelievable right inside the Staples Center. Uh, celebrities had gathered, and when I asked them, you know, why is it so important to be here? They said, I am here to witness history. And that's really what it was. And as for Kobe, it actually kind of started out a little slow in the game, but as everyone knows, he ended up scoring 60 points, and at the end of the game, he got on the microphone and he said, this has been beautiful, and then of course he said, Mamba out, and in the press conference afterwards, uh, he talked about how tomorrow morning, I'm going to be up early, and I'm going to be on the treadmill because I don't want to wake up without purpose. He did walk it back a little bit, Tom, to say it might not be really early because of the champagne today, but but I will be there. He didn't want to have a life without purpose. And it was actually Ramona Shelbourne in that press conference, I'll never forget, she asked him, you know, she said, obviously, Kobe, you're a legendary basketball player, but do you ever think that you will be as good at anything else as you are basketball? And he talked about his pursuit of perfection. And as we all know, he was that good at everything else. Uh, he won an Oscar. So everything that he did, he did it with 110% of himself. And that relentless pursuit of perfection was something that it was so easy to see. He was passing on to his daughters. And he was passing it on to the next generation of professional basketball players, both men and women. He was a huge advocate of the women's game. And he doesn't have to validate, you know, the women's game. It is what it is, and it's amazing. But he was there out of pure respect for these female athletes, and he was teaching Gianna how to follow in their footsteps. And I always thought that that was really a fantastic way to not only be a father, but to be a coach as well, and to teach her the ways of basketball that he knew and introduce her to these women that she could look up to. And as a basketball player myself, those are the kinds of things that you learn and they stay with you the rest of your life, you know? And so, Tom, when we're talking about the Mamba Mambasita Sports Foundation, these kids are learning about their lives through basketball, and that's something that Kobe Bryant has done for them, and that will be his lasting legacy. The Mamba mentality is not gender-specific, you know? It's for everybody, boys and girls, athletes of all kinds. Yeah, there really is no debate on the importance of youth sports. Kena, you know, before you came to Los Angeles, you were in Boston, another huge yeah. sports city. What was it like yeah. to move over here to L.A. and then to kind of move into Kobe City? 
It definitely is Kobe City, uh, no question about that. And of course, there's a huge rivalry between the Los Angeles Lakers and the Boston Celtics. And, you know, I think. Kobe's so big. He's bigger than basketball. He's bigger than the Lakers. He is Los Angeles. And so you just sort of fall in line, I think. And actually, Tom, it reminds me, you know, they canceled the Lakers game uh, after they were killed. You know, the last time that an NBA basketball game was canceled was the Boston Marathon bombing, and they canceled the Boston Celtics game. Um, and so, you know, when you're a fan of sports, you're a fan of sports, and there are certain athletes that really transcend the game. And I think that everybody, whether you're a Celtics fan or a Lakers fan, you respect Kobe and you respect what he gave to this game. Kana Whitworth for us this morning right here in downtown Los Angeles. Kana, thank you. I want to go back to ESPN analyst and former NBA player for the San Antonio Spurs, Bruce Bowen. Bruce, we're just five minutes away from this ceremony uh, about to get underway, and I want to know where your mind's at today and what you're going to be thinking about as you watch the ceremony. Well, my mind is just uh, with the families that were lost and, and how we get back to uh, some bit of normal activity in your lives because this is something that will change everyone's lives forever but at the same time we don't want to we don't want to be sad and, and and heartbroken forever over this but we want to try to do something positive with this and i think if there's anyone we can kind of look at and say what would this individual do and talking about kobe he would get back after things and so we understand we have to pick up the pieces in life but more importantly we can utilize what he stood for as far as that work ethic at being the best he could be in any and every Thing that he touched and use that as a motivating factor every single day that we're out here doing what we do whether it's your passion whether it's your love understand you can do so much more in life with a with a proud heart as far as getting after certain things in life and Bruce, what, what do you think the, the league will, will take away from this moving forward? Um, thinking about Kobe's legacy, we know that he most likely will be a Hall of Famer. The All-Star game changed some things around to honor Kobe Bryant. But moving on from this ceremony right here, Kobe will always have a place in, in the NBA's history. He definitely will, and that's the beautiful part about the NBA is how active they are with former players. And you talk about a former player of of Kobe's, his character, his legacy, and the way he touched the world with his game. You know, you will definitely, I believe, see something that will kind of be a tribute to him as far as a trophy, as far as an MVP. I mean, if anybody has that type of drive and desire that he had, I, I think it only adds to the value what the league is. Is. But most importantly, you just it continues to take me back to that individual that would fight tooth and nail for every single thing. As long as there was time on the clock, Kobe was going to utilize that time to try to do something spectacular in that moment. Bruce Bowen for us from San Antonio today, reflecting, discussing, and analyzing everything that is Kobe Bryant for us on this special here on ABC News Live. We are just literally minutes away from this ceremony getting underway. I've just gotten the two-minute wrap. Uh, we are about to go head inside to the Staples Center to honor Kobe Bryant, his daughter Gianna, and the seven others who lost their lives in that horrific helicopter crash. And we can't stress this enough. This is about Kobe and Gianna, but it is about those other people, those innocent lives who were lost when that helicopter went down nearly a month ago and, and it happened nearly a month ago but it took just minutes for that accident to take place to realize the impact that Kobe Bryant had not only here in Los Angeles but all over the world as a player as somebody who brought championships here to Los Angeles as an all-star member of Team USA a future Hall of Famer and also as somebody who was an ambassador for youth sports especially female youth sports coaching his daughter Gianna being right there on on the court side with his daughter games explaining the game to her supporting her we've seen since this death that hashtag girls dad just take off people proud to show that they are fathering daughters that they are part of their lives um, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in this ceremony because we really don't know what's going to happen it's still unclear if Vanessa Bryant will be here it's unclear who is going to speak who is going to perform we do know that the event sold out 20,000 tickets all the proceeds going to the Mamba and Mamba Sita Foundation so these will go to good cause 
clauses and really the city has made it very clear if you, if you don't have a ticket please watch from home please watch on places like ABC News Live and, and all the local stations that are covering this because they want this to be a solemn moment a special moment um, they don't want to have too much congestion they, they've actually blocked off streets and and put barricades with um, with sort of a black cover so people can't look inside they want to keep this as private and as intimate as possible uh, and for for the last month hundreds of thousands have come through the Staples Center uh, to leave memorabilia to remember Kobe Bryant and today is is sort of the epicenter of all of that today will be the day that that they honor Kobe and his daughter Gianna we are 10 seconds away from the ceremony getting underway right here in the Staples Center the house that Kobe built we thank you for joining our coverage let's go inside Yes, I'm ready. Good morning, and welcome to the celebration of life for Kobe and Gianna Bryant and their friends, John, Carrie, and Alyssa Altabelli, Sarah and Peyton Chester, Christina Mauser, and Ara Zabayan. On behalf of Vanessa and the entire Bryant family, we thank you for your thoughts and prayers during this difficult time and appreciate your love in coming to celebrate the life of these remarkable individuals. While this is a memorial event, the word celebration is very much a part of its purpose. And while we ask you to respect the solemnity of the occasion, we must not forget to celebrate the lives of Kobe, Gianna, and their friends. There is no doubt that he would have wanted that. To begin this event, a very close friend of the Bryant family is here to show her love and support to Vanessa and all the families here today. Please welcome Beyonce Knowles Carter. one of his favorite songs. So I want to start that over, but I want us to do it all together. And I want you to sing it so loud that you hear your love. Are y'all ready? Love you. Your love is bright as ever. Even in the shadows. Baby, kiss me.
didn't even make a sound. I found a way to let you in, but I never really had a doubt. Standing in the light of your halo. I got my angel now. Well, he might be only 18 years and five months old, but this guy can do everything that the veterans can do and do it better, perhaps. Kobe Bryant. your dreams your dreams won't come true something greater will memories bring back your there's a time that i remember when i never felt so lost and i felt i love the hatred was too powerful to stop and my heart feel like an ember and it's lighting up the dark i'll carry these torches for you and you know i never try Cheers to the wish 
Our thanks go out to Beyonce for being with us today and for expressing her love so beautifully. Another good friend of the Bryants and the Laker family is here to help guide us through this morning's celebration. Would you please welcome Jimmy Kimmel. Well, you, you picked the wrong person to guide you through. I'm going to tell you that right now. I want to thank everyone for being here, and uh, thank you for gathering to celebrate the lives of Alyssa Altabelli, her parents, John and Carrie Altabelli, Peyton Chester, her mother, Sarah Chester, Christina Mauser, Ara Zabayan, Gigi Bryant and her father, Kobe Bryant. Um, this is a sad day, but it is also a celebration of life, of their lives, and of life itself in the building where those of us who are Lakers fans and Kobe fans celebrated so many of the best times of our lives. And uh, I'm honored to have been asked to speak here. The proceeds from the tickets you bought uh, go directly to the Mamba and Mambasita Sports Foundation, which supports youth sports in underserved communities. And I also encourage you to go to mambaon3.org to give to the Mamba on 3 Fund, which was created to honor and provide financial support to the Chester, Altabelli, Zabayan, and Mauser families. I can only imagine how painful this is for them. I don't think any of us could have imagined this. Everywhere you go, you see his face, his number. Gigi's face, Gigi's number. Everywhere, at every intersection. There are hundreds of murals painted by artists who were inspired, not because he was a basketball player, but because Kobe was an artist too. And not just in LA, uh, across the country, in Kobe's hometown, Philadelphia, in Italy, in India, the Philippines, China, New York, Phoenix, Boston, for God's sake. 
in places where he would be booed on the court, Kobe is missed. Even the great Boston Celtic Bill Russell wore number 24 and a Lakers jersey to yesterday's game. I knew he would come to us eventually. <laughs> Today we're joined by Kobe's teammates and opponents alike, his friends, his family, and his fans, as we try to make sense of what happened to these nine beautiful people who were, by all accounts, so full of life, who left behind parents, friends, coworkers, classmates, siblings, and children. I've been uh, trying to come up with, uh, with something positive to take away from this, and um, it was hard because there isn't much. But the best thing I think I was able to come up with is this, gratitude. It seems to me that all we can do is be grateful for the time we had with them and for the time we have left with each other. And that's all. In the, in the Catholic Church, you know, which the Bryant family is part of at Mass, we share the sign of peace. This is a moment to uh, hug or shake hands with people around you, and it occurred to me that that is something that only seems to happen at church and at sporting events, when perfect strangers who love the same team are suddenly hugging and high-fiving and celebrating together. And so, since we are here today to celebrate, I'd like to invite you right now to take a moment to say hello to the people around you, whether you know them or not, to be grateful for life and for the fact that we are all here together. Now I'd like to introduce the person who invited us all here today on 224 because she knew we needed it. And we cannot celebrate the lives of Kobe and Gigi and all the people we lost without honoring the woman that Kobe and Gigi loved most. Please welcome Vanessa Bryant. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. It means so much to us. Love you too. Okay. First, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. The outpouring of love and support that my family has felt from around the world has been so uplifting. Thank you so much for all your prayers. I'd like to talk about both Kobe and Gigi, but I'll start with my baby girl first. My baby girl. She 
Gianna Bryant is an amazingly sweet and gentle soul. She was always thoughtful. She always kissed me goodnight and kissed me good morning. There were a few occasions where I was absolutely tired from being up with Bianca and Capri, and I thought she had left to school without saying goodbye. I text and say, no kiss, and Gianna would reply with, Mama, I kissed you, but you were asleep, and I didn't want to wake you. She knew how much her morning and evening kisses meant to me, and she was so thoughtful to remember to kiss me every day. She was daddy's girl, but I know she loved her mama, and she would always tell me and show me how much she loved me. She was one of my very best friends. She loved to bake. She loved putting a smile on everyone's face. Last August, she made a beautiful birthday cake for her daddy. It had fondant and looked like it had blue agate crystals. Kobe's birthday cake looked like it was professionally decorated. She made the best chocolate chip cookies. She loved watching cooking shows and cupcake wars with me. And she loved watching Survivor and NBA games on TV with her daddy. She also loved watching Disney movies with her sisters. Gigi was very competitive like her daddy, but Gianna had a sweet grace about her. Her smile was like sunshine. Her smile took up her entire face, like mine. Kobe always said she was me. She had my fire, my personality, and sarcasm. She was tender and loving on the inside. She had the best laugh. It was infectious. It was pure and genuine. Kobe and Gianna naturally gravitated towards each other. She had Kobe's ability to listen to a song and have all the lyrics memorized after listening to the song a couple of times. It was their secret talent. She was an incredible athlete. She was great at gymnastics, soccer, softball, dance, and basketball. She was an incredible dancer, too. She loved to swim, dance, do cartwheels, and jumps into our swimming pool, and Gigi loved her TikTok dances. Gigi was confident, but not in an arrogant way. She loved helping and teaching other people things. At school, she offered the boys basketball coaches to help give the boys basketball team some pointers. <laughs> like the triangle offense. She was very much like her daddy and that they both liked helping people learn new things and master them. They were great teachers. Gigi was very sweet. She always made sure everyone was okay. She was our shepherd. She always kept our family together. She loved family traditions. Family movie night and game night on vacations were important to her. Gigi always looked out for everyone. She was very much in tune with our feelings and wanted the best for us. Gianna was smart. She knew how to read, speak, and write Mandarin. She knew Spanish. She had great grades and kept them up, all while becoming an incredible basketball player. She was president of School Spirit on student council. She was director's assistant for her school play, just like her big sister. She was looking forward to graduating eighth grade and moving on to high school with her big sister, Natalia. I'm so happy she was given the opportunity to know that she was accepted to the same high school. She was really happy. Gianna made us all proud, and she still does. Gianna never tried to conform. She was always herself. She was a nice person, a leader, a teacher, wearing a white tee, black leggings, a denim jacket, white high-top converse, and a flannel tied around her waist with straight hair was her go-to style. She had so much swag and rhythm ever since she was a baby. She gave the best hugs and the best kisses. She had gorgeous soft lips like her daddy. And she would hug me and hold me so tight. I could feel her love me. I loved the way she looked up at me while hugging me. It was as if she was soaking me all in. We love each other so much. I miss her so much. She was so energetic. I couldn't keep up with her energy. 
She lapped Natalia and I on a track once. She was about six years old. <laughs> we let her have a head start. <laughs> she still dusted us. <clears throat> I miss her sweet kisses. I miss her cleverness. I miss her sarcasm, her wit, and that adorable sly side smile followed with a grin and a burst of laughter. We shared the same cat that ate the canary grin. Gigi was sunshine. She brightened up my day every day. I miss looking at her beautiful face. She was always so good, a rule follower. I knew I could always count on her to do the right thing. She was the most loving daughter, thoughtful little sister, and silly big sister. She happily helped carry the little's diaper bag or played with them. She liked helping me with Bianca and Capri. Bianca loved going to the playground, <clears throat> swimming and jumping on the trampoline with Gigi. I used to tell Gigi that I thought Coco considered her her favorite sister. Capri would smile from ear to ear when Gigi walked into the room, and Capri reminds me a lot of Gianna. They look alike and just smile with their whole face, pure joy. We will not be able to see Gigi go to high school with Natalia and ask her how her day went. We didn't get the chance to teach her how to drive a car. I won't be able to tell her how gorgeous she looks on her wedding day. I'll never get to see my baby girl walk down the aisle, have a father-daughter dance with her daddy, dance on the dance floor with me or have babies of her own. Gianna would have been an amazing mommy. She was very maternal ever since she was really little. Gigi would have most likely become the best player in the WNBA. She would have made a huge difference. She would have made a huge difference for women's basketball. Gigi was motivated to change the way everyone viewed women in sports. She wrote papers in school defending women and wrote about how the unequal pay difference for the NBA and WNBA leagues wasn't fair. And I truly feel she made positive changes for the WNBA players now, since they knew Gigi's goal was to eventually play in the WNBA. I'm still so proud of Gianna. She made a difference and was kind to everyone she met in the 13 years she was here on Earth. Her classmates shared many fond memories about Gianna with us, and those stories reminded me that Gianna loved and showed everyone that no act of kindness is ever too small to make a difference in someone's life. She was always, always, always considerate of others and their feelings. She was a beautiful, kind, happy, silly, thoughtful, and loving daughter and sister. She was so full of life, and had so much more to offer this world. I cannot imagine life without her. Mommy, Natalia, Bianca, Capri, and Daddy love you so much, Gigi. I will miss your sweet handmade cards, your sweet kisses, and your gorgeous smile. I miss you, all of you, every day. I love you. Okay, now for my soulmate. <clears throat> Kobe was known as a fierce competitor on the basketball court. The greatest of all time, a writer, an Oscar winner, and the Black Mamba. But to me, he was Kobe Kobe. My boo-boo, my baby, my papi chulo. I was his Vivi, his principessa, his reina, his queen mama, 
Mamba, and his Visky Maniski Fabuliski. I couldn't see him as a celebrity, nor just an incredible basketball player. He was my sweet husband and the beautiful father of our children. He was mine. He was my everything. Kobe and I have been together since I was 17 and a half years old. I was his first girlfriend, his first love, his wife, his best friend, his confidant, and his protector. He was the most amazing husband. Kobe loved me more than I could ever express or put into words. He was the early bird and I was the night owl. I was fire and he was ice and vice versa at times. We balanced each other out. He would do anything for me. I have no idea how I deserved a man that loved and wanted me more than Kobe. He was charismatic, a gentleman, he was loving, adoring, and romantic. He was truly the romantic one in our relationship and looked forward to Valentine's Day and our anniversaries every year. He planned special anniversary trips and a special traditional gift for every year of our marriage. He even handmade my most treasured gifts. He just thought outside the box and was so thoughtful even while working hard to be the best athlete. He gave to me the actual notebook and the blue dress Rachel McAdams wore in the notebook movie. When I asked him why he chose the blue dress, he said it was because it's a scene when Allie comes back to Noah. We had hoped to grow old together like the movie. We really had an amazing love story. We loved each other with our whole beings. Two perfectly imperfect people making a beautiful family and raising our sweet and amazing girls. A couple weeks before they passed, Kobe sent me a sweet text and mentioned how he wanted to spend time together. Just the two of us without our kids because I'm his best friend first. We never got the chance to do it. We were busy taking care of our girls and just doing our regular, everyday responsibilities. But I'm thankful I have that recent text. It means so much to me. Kobe wanted us to renew our vows. He wanted Natalia to take over his company and he wanted to travel the world together. We had always talked about how we'd be the fun grandparents to our daughter's children. He would have been the coolest grandpa. Kobe was the MVP of Girl Dads, or MVD. He never left the toilet seat up. <laughs> he always told the girls how beautiful and smart they are. He taught them how to be brave and how to keep pushing forward when things get tough. And when Kobe retired from the NBA, he took over dropping off and picking up our girls from school since I was at home pregnant with Bianca and just recently home nursing Capri. When Kobe was still playing, I used to show up an hour early to be the first in line to pick up Natalia and Gianna from school, and I told him he couldn't drop the ball once he took over. He was late one time, and we most definitely let him know that I was never late. So we showed up one hour and 20 minutes early after that. <laughs> he always knew there was room for improvement and wanted to do better. He happily did carpool and enjoyed spending time in the car with our girls. He was a doting father, a father that was hands-on and present. He helped me bathe Bianca and Capri almost every night. He would sing them silly songs in the shower and continue making them laugh and smile as he lathered them in lotion and got them ready for bed. He had magic arms and could put Capri to sleep in only a few minutes. He said he had it down to a science, eight times up and down our hallway. <laughs> he loved taking Bianca to Fashion Island and watch her play in the Koi Pond area and loved taking her to the park. Their most recent visit to the Koi Pond was the evening before he and Gigi passed. He shared a love of movies and the breakdown of films with Natalia. 
He enjoyed renting out theaters and taking Natalia to watch the newest Star Wars movie or Harry Potter films. And they would have movie marathons and he enjoyed every second of it. He loved your tip typical tear jerkers too. He liked watching Stepmom, Steel Magnolias, and Little Women. He had a tender heart. Kobe somehow knew where I was at all times, specifically when I was late to his games. He would worry about me if I wasn't in my seat at the start of, the, of each game and would ask security where I was at the first timeout of the first quarter. And my smart ass would tell him that he wasn't going to drop 81 points within the first 10 minutes of the game. <laughs> I think anyone with kids understands that sometimes we can't make it out the door on time. And eventually he was used to my tardiness and balled out. The fact that he could play on an intense professional level and still be concerned by making sure we made it to the game safely was just another example of how family came first to him. He loved being Gianna's basketball coach. He told me he wished he would have convinced Natalia to play basketball so that they could have spent even more time together. But he also wanted her to pursue her own passion. He watched Natalia play in a volleyball tournament on her birthday on January 19th. And he noticed how she's a very intelligent player. He was convinced she would have made a great point card with her vision of the court. And he told me that he wanted Bianca and Capri to take up basketball when they get older so he could spend just as much time with them as he did with Gigi. And Kobe always told Bianca and Capri that they were going to grow up and play basketball and mix their ass up. Now they won't have their daddy and sister here to teach them, and that is truly a loss I do not understand. But I'm so thankful Kobe heard Coco say, Dada. He isn't going to be here to drop Bianca and Capri off at pre-K or kindergarten. He isn't going to be here to tell me to get a grip V when we have to leave the kindergarten classroom or show up to our daughter's doctor's visits for my own moral support. He isn't going to be able to walk our girls down the aisle or spin me around on the dance floor while singing PYT to me. But I want my daughters to know and remember the amazing person, husband, and father he was. The kind of man that wanted to teach the future generations to be better and keep them from making his own mistakes. He always liked working and doing projects to improve kids' lives. He taught us all valuable lessons about life and sports through his MBA career, his books, his show Detail, and his Punies podcast series. And we're so thankful he left those lessons and stories behind for us. He was thoughtful and wrote the best love letters and cards, and Gigi had his wonderful ability to express her feelings into paper and make you feel her love through her words. She was thoughtful like him. They were so easy to love. Everyone naturally gravitated towards them. They were funny, happy, silly, and they loved life. They were so full of joy and adventure. God knew they couldn't be on this earth without each other. He had to bring them home to heaven together. Babe, you take care of our Gigi. And I got Nani, Bibi, and Coco. We're still the best team. We love and miss you, Boo Boo and Gigi. May you both rest in peace and have fun in heaven until we meet again one day. We love you both and miss you forever and always. Mommy.
The speaker from uh, whom we are about to hear was very special to the Bryant family. She is their dear friend, uh, who is also a four-time Olympic gold medalist, a three-time WNBA champion, three-time NCAA champion, the WNBA's all-time leading scorer. And if that isn't enough to convince you that she's one of the best of all time, Kobe gave her the greatest honor of all. He nicknamed her after himself. Please welcome the White Mamba, Diana Taurasi. My name is Diana Taurasi. Thanks, Jimmy, you stole my first joke. I am the White Mamba. <laughs> I would first like to offer my deepest condolences to all the families who lost a loved one. In 1996, I was a lanky, awkward freshman in high school, obsessively shooting night after night in my driveway. On the nights the Lakers played, I wouldn't miss a second of the game. Every time out, every commercial, I run to the front yard to imitate my favorite Laker, Kobe. <laughs> On a few lucky occasions, my dad would come home from work. He was a metal sheet worker in Los Angeles, and he'd come home with Laker tickets. Watching Kobe play at the Great Western Forum as a rookie made this little girl believe she could be a Laker one day. It was like getting to know myself every single day. He made it okay to play, to play with an edge that borderlined crazy. Early onset Mamba mentality was in full effect. Years later, when I spent time with Kobe at the 2008 Olympics, I learned firsthand that it just wasn't limited to the basketball court. His competitive fire ran through his veins, just like many of us today. Every single workout, I end the same way with the Kobe game winner. Three hard dribbles going right. Left foot plant pivot. Swing right leg through. Elevate, square up. Follow through. Five in a row and I got to go home. It's that exact same shot that won us a championship in Phoenix in 2014. Kobe's willingness to do the hard work and make the sacrifice every single day inspired me and resonated with the city of Los Angeles. We struggled together, we grew together, we celebrated victories together. The same passion we all recognized in Kobe, obviously Gigi inherited. Her skill was undeniable at an early age. I mean, who has a turn away fadeaway jumper at 11? LeBron barely got it today. It was her curiosity about the game that was pushing her to pick up the basketball every single day. Gigi was in the midst of the best times of a basketball player's career. No responsibilities, no expectations, just basketball with your best friends. Every weekend was a new adventure, an opportunity to learn how to work and grow together as a unit. As a young kid, there's nothing you looked forward to more than long hut summer days in the gym with your homies. The same way Kobe inspired a generation of basketball players, Gigi in turn Kobe's interest in coaching and teaching the game. I'm sure I'm not the only one who received a text from Kobe asking what drills they were doing when they were 13. Gigi in many ways represents the future of women's basketball. A future where a young woman aspires to play in the WNBA, the same way I wanted to be a Laker. Gigi already had goals to play for UConn. That in itself showed her fearless mentality. 
She represents a time where a young girl doesn't need permission to play. Her skill would command respect. The last time I saw Gigi, the mamas were in Phoenix for a big AU tournament. Kobe brought them to the, to the locker room to watch practice. I always remember the look on Gigi's face. It was a look of excitement, a look of belonging, a look of fierce determination. As a daughter, a sister, wife, and mother, we embrace Vanessa, Natalia, Bianca, and Capri. We promise to carry Gigi's legacy. Kobe and Gigi are in the heart of Los Angeles, and Los Angeles never mueren. Te queremos mucho. Just as her father was to our next speaker, our next speaker was to Gianna. Mentors know no gender or race, they just know they're here to help others. And one of Gianna's most impactful teachers and friends was Sabrina Ionescu. Following her appearance here this morning, she'll fly back to the Bay Area to face Stanford, undoubtedly with thoughts of her time here ever present in her mind. Please welcome NCAA all-time leader in points, assist, and three-point field goals, Sabrina Ionescu. Growing up, I only knew one way to play the game of basketball, fierce, with obsessive focus. I was unapologetically competitive. I wanted to be the best. I loved the work even when it was hard, especially if it was hard. I knew I was different, that my drive was different. I grew up watching Kobe Bryant, game after game, ring after ring, living his greatness without apology. I wanted to be just like him, to love every part of the competition to be the first to show up and the last to leave, to love the grind, to be your best when you don't feel your best and make other people around you the best version of themselves and to wake up and do it again the next day. So that's what I did. Wake up, grind, and get better. Wake up, grind, and get better. A year ago, my team, Oregon, was playing at USC. The morning of the game, our coaches told us that there was a surprise for the day. I was thinking Nike sent us some new shoes or swag or something. The game starts and shortly after, Kobe walks in with his daughter, Gianna, and two of her teammates. They sat courtside while my jaw sat dropped. They watched the entire game, and that was the first time I met Kobe. Kobe, Gigi, and her teammates came into the locker room after the game. He congratulated us on the win that day in our season up to that point, but said, and I'll never forget, don't shoot yourselves in the foot. He meant don't settle, to keep grinding. Control what you can. The national championship wasn't far and our goal was to win it all. I remember Gigi, excited and smiling in the locker room. I'd always watch a ton of film of her playing basketball. She had a fadeaway better than mine. I asked her where she wanted to play ball in college and she said UConn. She had the will and determination to be able to play wherever she wanted. And if she wanted to go there, I wanted her there as well. She and her teammates hung out with us for a while, starstruck and a little shy, but always observing. Whichever school she would come to choose, it didn't matter. If I represented the present of the women's game, Gigi was the future, and Kobe knew it. So we decided to build the future together. I worked out twice with Gigi over the summer. I'd gone down to help Kobe coach his team. Gigi had so much of her dad's skill set. You could tell the amount of hours they spent in the gym practicing her moves. She smiled all the time, but when it was game time, she was ready to kill. Her demeanor changed almost instantly when the whistle blew. I remember one time someone grabbed her jersey and she sort of just knocked him down and then stepped right over him. <laughs> Me and Kobe looked at each other, smiling, and he goes, I don't know where she learned that from. <laughs> I laughed and said, I do. 
You can't teach that, and definitely not at her age. Kobe was right, she had it. I love watching how hard she worked and how much her teammates loved her, but also her own desire to be great. She always wanted to learn, to go to every game she could, college, NBA, WNBA. Kobe was helping her with that because he saw it in her, just like he saw it in me. His vision for others is always bigger than what they imagine for themselves. His vision for me was way bigger than my own. More importantly, he didn't just show up in my life and leave, he stayed. We kept in touch, always texting, calls, game visits. I'd drop a triple-double and have a text from him. A double, triple-double I see with a flex emoji. Another game, another text. Yo, beast mode, or easy money. I felt some pressure early on in the season and he wrote to me, be you, it's been good enough and that will continue to be good enough. He taught me his step back. He told me that if I could bring that to my game, it'd be over for any defender trying to guard me. He told me how high my arc needed to be on my shot, how to angle my foot, which leg to kick out, how much power to push off. Real sharpness comes without effort, he said. He was giving me the blueprint. He was giving Gigi the same blueprint. He united us. He made it so that the outsiders who outworked everyone else, who were driven to be just a little bit different every single day, to make those around them, behind them, and above them a little bit better every single day. And they weren't the exception, they were the rule. I wanted to be a part of the generation that changed basketball for Gigi and her teammates, where being born female didn't mean being born behind, where greatness wasn't divided by gender. You have too much to give to stay silent. That's what he said, that's what he believed, that's what he lived, through Gigi, through me, through his investment in women's basketball. That was his next great act, a girl dad. Basketball in many ways was just a metaphor. I still text them even though he's not here. Thank you for everything, the rest is for you. Rest easy, my guy. The last one I sent him said, I miss you, may you rest in peace, my dear friend. The texts go through, but no response. It still feels like he's there on the other end, that the next time I pick up my phone, he would have hit me back. Sometimes I find myself still waiting. It's so strange to describe him or Gigi in the past tense. You don't get used to that. No one tells you that about grief. The week after the accident, I was in Colorado. I had a game, and like I do before every game, I prayed. This time I was thinking about Kobe and Gigi. His voice is still in my head, even if his body is not on this earth. And all I wanted was a sign that in some way he still heard me too. I looked off into the sky and there it was, a beautiful golden sunset. The boldest yellow, Lakers yellow, and further in the distance, a helicopter. There was my sign that he will forever be with me. I heard his voice in my head, the last line from one of his books. Walk until the darkness is a memory and you become the sun on the next traveler's horizon. Today may feel like darkness. He was, in so many ways, a sun, beaming, radiating, fixed in the sky. I ask each of you, every girl dad, every human here with a voice, a platform, and a heart, to not let his sun set. Shine for us, for our sport where he once did. Invest in us with the same passion and drive and respect and love as he did his own daughter. In the end, she was a sun just starting to rise, and God did she glow. May their light forever shine. Kobe and Gigi, I'll love you forever. Thank you. Among the many dreams that the lovely Gianna would have realized in her life was that of playing for one of the greatest women's collegiate basketball teams in history, the Huskies of UConn. One of the highlights of her and her father's lives was a visit they made to the campus in March 2019. Here today to speak on his friendship with both of them is the 11-time NCAA championship coach of the Huskies, Gino Oriyama.
There's some amazing women in this room, aren't there? And you just heard from three of them. I'm Gino Oriyama, and I'm the coach of the UConn women's basketball program. Um, and a lot of people are going to talk about basketball today. And I don't know that that's why I'm here. I'm not here for the basketball part. I tried to write a long, flowing speech about basketball, and I can't do it. There's too many thoughts in my head ever since Vanessa asked me to speak. Too many things that uh, made me realize more that I'm here as a father, not as a basketball coach. And us Italians, as these just showed you, we're very, we're very, very emotional people. Right, Mike? He's half Italian. <clears throat> so the thoughts that I started to have after I was asked to speak were obviously about all the people that were on board. And if you're a father, a grandfather, you feel a different, a different kind of emotion when there are children involved. Because this is always about the children. We've lived our lives. We have a little bit left. They're just starting their lives. And then my next thought came to the original team that Kobe was responsible for, Natalia, Bianca, Capri, Vanessa. Because we're always teammates, you know? We're always on a team. Sometimes it's a big team, sometimes it's a small team. And that's the most important team. And Kobe and I shared some history. He started in Italy, went to Philadelphia, and then went to the limelight and the lights and glamour of LA. I was born in Philadelphia, went to Philly, and went to the cows up in stores. <clears throat> that was a joke, because there's no lights and there's no glitz and glamour in stores, Connecticut. And how ironic that he would talk to me about coaching. The uncoachable one wants to talk about coaching. <laughs> Probably the most uncoachable player in the NBA during his career wants to know about coaching. And I wanted to know why. He said, I'm coaching my daughter's team. I said, oh my God, that poor kid. <laughs> so when I watched highlights of her playing, and on about the third or fourth time she touched the ball, Gianna passed it when she was open. I thought, she's not listening to her father. <laughs> so he would call and say, what kind of defensive drills should I do? We have practice tonight, we're gonna to work on defense. What do you think is the most important thing in teaching man to man? Further proof, he never listened to one word any of his coaches told him. So I tried to explain to them, I said, Kobe, they're 13 years old, I think you ought to just say, hey, you know, see the kid with the ball, try not to let her go by you and see if you're guarding the other guys, hey, see the kid with the ball over there, don't let her throw the ball to your guy. Keep it kind of simple, you know? He said, no, I want to know, like, what are the rotations when they drive? I said, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> so these are the conversations that we have both as basketball people and as dads who have ever coached their kids, if you've ever been in that situation, like a lot of people here in this room probably have been. And I remember when Gigi came, as you saw in that video, she came to our very uh, the very first game that she came to, and she came into the locker room. And here she is, 
And the look on her face, the smile, the way her eyes just took everything in, how excited she was to be around, in her mind, royalty. It's ironic. <laughs> her father's royalty. And she's excited to be around royalty that looks just like what she wants to be. And the most impressive thing about that point in time was how Kobe stepped as far back as he could. So anyone taking pictures, anyone there, would not know that this was Kobe Bryant's daughter. This was her moment. This is her, her time to shine. This was her time to experience all the things that he's experienced his whole life. He was being dad, he wasn't being Kobe Bryant. And he was allowing Gigi to be Gigi, not Kobe Bryant's daughter. In today's day and age, that's a hell of a thing for parents to be able to do. I'm gonna leave you with just two things. We got a letter. Oh, I gotta tell you about, you didn't see it, but she did meet the uh, Oregon Ducks women's basketball team. And they all gathered around and said, you wanna take your picture? And everybody ran over and Gigi goes, nah, I'm good. <laughs> she knew where her heart was. And you know that little sarcasm, I'm good. And when they, came to, when they came to UConn and they sat behind the bench, and there's dad bringing his daughter to a game, and they have their shirts on, and she's got this coat on, and she has her hat on, and she's just a little kid at a game. And again, I felt more like a dad than I felt as a basketball coach, because I've done that with my kids. And lastly, <clears throat> Number 24, number eight, and number two. Those are basketball numbers. Those are numbers in the past. Those are numbers that we're not gonna get back. What we do have is today how many numbers of kids like Diana have been inspired to do more, to work harder, to strive for more. And the numbers we also don't have is how many numbers of kids in the future, how many women are gonna be inspired by Gigi's life? How many fathers are inspired by Kobe to be fathers, to really be fathers, the way a father is supposed to be? In this room, there is an incredible amount of talent. In this room is maybe the greatest collection of talent that I've ever been around. But in this room, there's a family, and there's still a team back home, and they still have a great coach. And I'm gonna be rooting for that team from here on in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coach. Now I want to play for a UConn women's basketball team. <laughs> Our next speaker is the general manager of the Los Angeles Lakers. Before that, he was Kobe's agent, and most notably for our purposes today, he is one of Kobe's closest and best friends and godfather to Gigi. Please welcome Rob Palinka.
The world knows Kobe as a basketball legend, but I've been blessed for 20 years to know him as so much more. The Kobe I know had three unique sides that I hope to quickly honor today. Kobe the best friend, Kobe the dad, and Kobe the husband. I will start with Kobe the best friend. Do you remember where you were on that foggy, sunless morning of January 26 when the axis of the world seemed to shift forever for all of us? I was in Sunday church with my family. My phone was deep in the pocket of my jeans when I felt the familiar text buzz. For a second, I ignored the notification because I was in church. But for some reason, with this text, I felt a sudden urge to check my phone. I slipped it out of my jeans and discovered the text was from Kobe. There was nothing uncharacteristic or unfamiliar about this. For the last two decades, Kobe and I talked or texted every single day because that's what best friends do. In that moment, my instincts were to put the phone down and get back to the preacher's sermon, but a gentle, otherworldly nudge compelled me to open the text, so I did. I quickly saw that Kobe was asking me if I happened to know a certain baseball agent based in Southern California. Since Kobe's question didn't have any urgency to do it, I decided I'd wait until after church to respond. But then again, there was a gentle nudge. I grabbed my phone and texted Kobe back that I had seen the baseball agent at a Lakers game just the other night and was happy to help him with whatever he wanted. It was now just past 9.30. Kobe texts back explaining his desire to help a friend of his secure a baseball agency internship for one of his young daughters. Kobe vouched for the girl's character, intellect, and work ethic. He clearly wanted to champion a bright future for her. I text Kobe right back and said I would put a plan in motion to help him get that done. A handful of minutes later, Kobe and Gianna and seven other beautiful souls ascended into heaven. Kobe had been texting me from the helicopter. The girl in that text chain was, that he was wanting to help so badly was Lexi Altabelli, the surviving daughter of Coach John Altabelli, who was also on the helicopters. Kobe's last human act was heroic. He wanted to use his platform to bless and shape a young girl's future. Hasn't Kobe done that for all of us? Kobe was literally the best friend anyone could ask for. He always championed and passionately celebrated the accomplishments of others and downplayed his own. The man who had won multiple NBA titles, MVPs, and an Oscar would buzz with excitement when someone he loved would reach even a simple goal. With any achievement, Kobe was always the first to call. This was one of his greatest gifts as a friend and something I will forever miss. There's one story that shows this beautiful side to Kobe. As Vanessa shared, in the years following his retirement, Kobe was often one of the first carpools to pick up his daughters from school. With Kobe in pole position, my kids who attended the same school also got to see him often. Every time they would see him, he would greet them with an, an enthusiasm if they had just won student of the year. The other day, my nine-year-old daughter, Emery, had big tears in her eyes because she was so badly missing Uncle Kobe and Gigi. When I asked her why, she said, Daddy, whenever Kobe would see me, he would run to me and scoop me up in his giant arms and raise me high above his head. Kobe always made me feel like I was queen of the world. Kobe had a depth of care for people that is unparalleled. He made every moment magical, as if it was living a fantasy novel. This was the case when my family and the Bryants went on a camping, or I should say glamping trip, to Montana. We canoed and rode horses, went fly fishing and river rafting, and rode on a stagecoach to a campfire dinner under the stars. At each turn, Kobe made everything an adventure, especially for the kids. And of course, with all the wilderness activities we did, they had to be done to the nth degree. If it was fly fishing, we had to learn to tie our own flies and fish standing in the stream with heavy wader boots on. No shortcuts. 
Kobe's enthusiasm and joy for all things life made that trip one for a lifetime. Another remarkable friendship quality of Kobe's is that he mastered the art of making the things his friends loved, things that he loved. When I got the Lakers GM job, Kobe would often say that my life and his life had flip-flopped. Instead of him, I was now the one with the regimented Lakers schedule of practices, games, and road trips. I was now the one daily commuting up the 405 from the OC to LA. On the flip side, Kobe was home chilling in Newport Beach, doing all his Kobe Inc. work from his favorite spot in the world. Having lived the demands of the NBA for 20 years, Kobe understood the toll it would take on my family time. So he and Vanessa would regularly check in with my wife and kids to make sure everything was good and even celebrate hol uh, holidays like Halloween with them. That's what friends do. Kobe lived to make other people's lives better all the way up until his final text. The day after Kobe was gone, I was at home and feeling totally lost. I couldn't imagine life without the strength and guidance of my best friend. As part of my grieving, I felt an overwhelming need to connect with something tangible that represented our friendship, a picture, a voicemail, something that Kobe left behind. My wife reminded me of the Wizenard book Kobe authored and had recently given to me. I went upstairs and found the book in my library and opened it, and on the inside cover, he had penned in his, with his own pen these words. To RP, my brother, may you always remember to enjoy the road, especially when it's a hard one. Love, Kobe. Kobe wrote these words to me just a few months ago. Now I realize that perhaps they were meant for us all. Kobe, my brother, this road is so, so hard and I don't know how to journey on without you. But I know you want us to keep going and our memories with you will give us strength to somehow move forward. And as you wrote, even in the valley of unimaginable loss, we will somehow find a way to have joy. On to Kobe's next side, Kobe the dad. When Kobe retired from playing basketball, people would often ask me what, how I thought he would fuel his competitive drive. The answers came in a couple surprising ways. The first was in a new sport, tennis. Right after Kobe stopped playing for the Lakers, we took up playing tennis at a local private club in Newport Beach. We began having epic one-on-one -on -one battles. I picked the game up faster than him, so early on he would often fall behind. And that did not sit well with Kobe at all. So what does the Black Mamba do? The next few times I arrived at the club, there he was waiting for me already with a full sweat. As his tennis skills exploded, I learned that he had secretly reached out to the club's pro for private lessons and didn't share any of it with me. <laughs> Typical Mamba mentality. We loved our matches and stories and memories we would share on those beautiful California days. It was during one of those tennis conversations that the other newfound competitive love of his became so clear, coaching Gianna's youth basketball team. Kobe talked constantly about his dream to create the best youth girls basketball team on the planet, and he did. It started with his individual work with Gigi and quickly spread to all the girls on Team Mamba. Long practices every night, precision in everything, the individual drills, the set plays, the triangle cuts, the defensive schemes. It was all Kobe's masterpiece. I will never forget when Kobe challenged my 12-year-old son's all-star team to a game against his Mamba team. Yes, girls versus boys. Kobe hosted the game at a local high school gym with refs, timekeepers, and all. He coached from the bench, but rarely said anything. Instead, the Mambas were so well prepared, they functioned like a Swiss watch. Everything seemed scripted and versed. Our boys got smashed. <laughs> Kobe and Gigi took it all in stride. That's what the Mambas do. Kobe's love for coaching grew and grew and grew. I remember when Kobe turned 40 to celebrate, our families flew to Cabo to spend a long weekend at one of the most beautiful uh, ocean estates in the world. What was the one thing Kobe wanted to do in this heavenly setting? Watch Team Mamba game film with Gigi and me, of course, breaking down every play.
Kobe's love and passion for this team was the perfect representation of how deeply he loved his daughters. At the center of all this was his precious Gigi, whom my wife and I are blessed to be the godparents of. From the moment Kristen and I dressed Gigi in her pure white lace baptismal dress as an infant, she kicked and wiggled her way into our world like only a Taurus can. Gigi was an incredible combination of strength, courage, grace, and dignity with a witty sense of humor that was simply captivating. She smiled with her glittering eyes and was literally everything in the world that is good. In our home, Gianna and her sister Natalia have become the gold standard for character and kindness. Gigi was love and grace, and like her dad, her life was about blessing, blessing others. Simply put, Gigi was Kobe's pride and joy on the basketball court, and you could see it with every move she made. If basketball was the love Kobe shared with Gigi, with Nani, Kobe shared a love for storytelling. The two of them seemed to live out scenes of the most beautiful movie ever made. Kobe and Nani had a common language built upon joy and inspiration. They could re remember and recite movie lines and sing Disney songs, always filling a room with smiles and laughter. Kobe and Nani, Nani created their own soundtrack for life, it seemed. And in it, you could often find them dancing their days away together. Around young children, Kobe was like Santa Claus dressed in everyday clothes. Kobe had an unmatched energy to ignite kids and make them smile and laugh and love. In my years as his agent, I was told he was one of the most granted Make-A-Wish celebrities of our generation. When Kobe met a Make-A-Wish kid, it was as if heaven came down to the real world. This exuberant sense of play captured the way Kobe would love and father his daughter, Bibi. Like Kobe, Bibi is a child of wonderment. Every moment of Bibi seems born out of joy and excitement and awe. And Kobe had an ability to enter into that world with her. Kobe also had an energy level that would match BBs. When the two of them would play, I imagined a world coming alive where toy animals would dance, teacups would sing, and rainbows would shine. I had never seen anything like the two of them playing together. If you think Kobe's hands were good with the basketball, you should see how his hands were with his daughter, Coco. He literally had the golden touch. Watching him cuddle and put Coco to sleep and caress her made you realize just how tender Kobe was. He is literally the baby whisperer, and in his arms is where you would find Coco always content with peace. Kobe would never miss a detail of his daughter's lives. When he traveled with me for work, he would spend hours on the phone connecting and listening to the stories of their days. He just loved his girls, and there was nothing in the world that meant more to him. I remember being in the tunnel with Kobe, right over there, the last time he would wear his purple and gold. Kobe fist bumped each of his daughters before he ran out the tunnel, and in Mamba speak said something like, here's what you do when the world tells you you can't do it anymore. Kobe's 60 points and win that night only, is only outshined by his love for his family as the world's greatest girl dad. Kobe's final side, the husband. When God made Kobe, the next great act of his was to fashion Vanessa. I know this because they are matched perfectly together and I've had a front row seat to being witness to their love for 20 years. I remember all the way back to their wedding day in 2001. In typical Kobe fashion, he wanted to master every detail of that day to reflect his love for Vanessa. One of the things he was most excited about was carrying Vanessa in his arms over the threshold of their home as a husband and wife for the first time. Vanessa brought out Kobe's romantic side like nobody else in the world could. He loved to celebrate holidays with her, her birthday anniversary, and especially Valentine's Day. Often he would call me to brainstorm his incredible ideas for special gifts and romantic occasions with her. He even loved to write poems and letters to her and make them into beautiful keepsake books. Simply put, Kobe's love for Vanessa was the energy for his life. One particular story captures the depth of Kobe's love for Vanessa. There was a stretch of days when work travel was causing Kobe to be away from Vanessa for longer than he wanted. He called me to explain how hard this stretch was for him. One night on the phone, Kobe noticed there was a grand piano in the hotel suite he was staying in. He said it sat by a tall window under the moonlit sky. 
During one of our calls, he shared an idea with me. He said he hadn't been sleeping much at night because he was vis missing V and the girls so much. While he was away, he wanted to live in his love for Vanessa, so at night, under the moonlit sky, he vowed to teach himself by ear to play the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlit Sonata. When he told me this, I thought, there's no way. I knew he wasn't a trained musician, and that was a really difficult piece of music to play. But Kobe's passion and love for Vanessa, combined with the patience and focus that only the Black Mamba has, made this seemingly impossible goal a reality. That next morning, Kobe called and played me the first few measures. The next morning, more. By the end of the week, he had the entire piece mastered, and he played it for me over the phone without a mistake. In my heart, I knew that moment was one of Kobe's grandest feats for his deepest love. Kobe had mastered one of the greatest piano movements ever written as a symbol of one of the most beautiful loves the world has ever seen. To close, I will say this. Just as the sun lights the moon to guide us through the night, Kobe and Gigi will continue to shine light in all of us. But unlike the sun, Kobe and Gigi's fuel will never, ever burn out because their light is eternal. Yes, the axis of our world shifted that frightful morning a few weeks back, but with Kobe and Gigi's moonlight, we will never have to live in the darkness of night again. We will all journey on until one day we will be in heaven together again, and this time, it will be forever. I love you, dear Kobe and precious Gigi. We love you, Vanessa, Nani, BB, Coco, and we are here for you with great care until the end of our days. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, here to play tribute with her own version of Beethoven's Moonlit Sonata, Miss Alicia Keys. It was Grammy Sunday when we all learned about the tragic loss of Kobe, Gianna, and their group. Here at Staples, we were all preparing for the Grammy Awards, and so was our host, Alicia Keys. As the sad news settled in, it became clear that as the world began to mourn them, here at the house that Kobe built, we had to do more than that. 
And thanks to the inner strength of Alicia Keys, she became a messenger of comfort to the people gathered here on that evening, as well as to the rest of the world. She's here tonight to perform one of Kobe and Vanessa's favorite musical numbers, the immortal Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. Please welcome Alicia Keys. Sentiva molto di Reggio. From Lower Merion High School in 
Pennsylvania. But this kid right here, mark my words, is going to be unbelievable. Four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, taking 500 shots. for the Los Angeles Lakers, a three-peat and a sweep. Your fourth NBA championship. The LA Lakers, the 2010 NBA champions. And that was the first time I knew of your greatness. You would think about what should I do to motivate this guy, this guy, this guy. 81-point game. Olympic champion, the United States of America. Falls down, and he is hurting. But the Lakers need him at the free throw line. He didn't just show up at games. He was deeply involved in that. Coaching young kids is the most important thing we can do. You couldn't have written this. I have to believe that Kobe right now is looking down from heaven and going, I am determined to learn to play Moonlight Sonata better than Alicia Keys. <laughs> Poor Chick Hearn is sitting there listening to it all. In 1996, our next speaker faced an 18-year-old Kobe Bryant on the court for the first time. Midway through the game, while playing, Kobe asked him for tips on his jump shot. Kobe scored 33 points that game against his boyhood idol. Michael scored 36 and won the game too. Uh, please welcome Michael Jordan. I would say good morning, but it's afternoon. I'm grateful to Vanessa and the Bryan family for the opportunity to speak today. I'm grateful to be here to honor Gigi and celebrate the gift that Kobe gave us all. What he accomplished as a basketball player, as a businessman, and a storyteller, and as a father. In the game of basketball, in life, as a parent, Kobe left nothing in the tank. He left it all on the floor. Maybe it surprised people that Kobe and I were very close friends, but we were very close friends. Kobe was my dear friend. He was like a little brother. Everyone always wanted to talk about the comparisons between he and I. I just wanted to talk about Kobe. You know, all of us have brothers and sisters, little brothers, little sisters who, for whatever reason, 
I always tend to get in your stuff, <laughs> your closet, your shoes, everything. It was a nuisance, if I can say that word. But that nuisance turned into love over a period of time, just because the admiration that they had for you as big brothers or big sisters. The questions, the wanting to know every little detail about life that they were about to embark on. He used to call me, text me, 11.30, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Talking about post-up moves, footwork, and sometimes the triangle. <laughs> At first, it was an aggravation. <laughs> but it, then it turned into a certain passion. This kid had passion like you would never know. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing about passion. If you love something, if you have a strong passion for something, you would go to the extreme to, to try to understand or try to get it. Either ice cream, Cokes, hamburgers, whatever you have a love for. If you have to walk, you would go get it. If you have to beg someone, you would go get it. What Kobe Bryant was to me was the inspiration that someone truly cared about the way I either I played the game or the way that he wanted to play the game. He wanted to be the best basketball player that he could be. And as I got to know him, I wanted to be the best big brother that I could be. <laughs> to do that, you had to put up with the aggravation, the late night calls, or the dumb questions. I took great pride as I got to know Kobe Bryant that he was just trying to be a better person, a better basketball player. We talked about business. We talked about family. We talked about everything. And he was just trying to be a better person. Now he's got me. I'll have to look at another crime meme for the next. <laughs> I told my wife I wasn't going to do this because I didn't want to see that for the next three or four years. That is what Kobe Bryant does to me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Vanessa and his friends all can say the same thing. He knows how to get to you in a way that affects you personally, even though if he's being a pain in the ass. <laughs> but it sh he always, you ever have a sense of love for him in the way that he can bring out the best in you. And he did that for me. I remember maybe a couple of months ago, he sends me a text and he's saying, I'm trying to teach my daughter some moves. And I don't know what I was thinking or what I was working on, but what, would you, what were you thinking about when you were trying to, as you were growing up, trying to work on your moves? I said, what age? He says, 12. <laughs> I said, 12, I was trying to play baseball. <laughs> he sends me a text back saying, laughing my ass off. <laughs> and this was at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but the thing about him was we could talk about anything that 
related to basketball, but we can talk about anything that related to life. And we, as we grow up in life, rarely have friends that we can have conversations like that. Well, it's even rare when you can grow up against adversaries and have conversations like that. I went and saw Phil Jackson in 1999 or maybe 2000. I don't know when Phil was here in L.A. And I walk in and Kobe's sitting there. And the first thing, I'm in a suit. The first thing Kobe said, did you bring your shoes? <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking about playing. <laughs> but his attitude to compete and play against someone he felt like he could enhance and improve his game with. To me, that's what I loved about the kid. Absolutely loved about his, the kid. No matter where he saw me, it was a challenge. And I admired him because his passion, you rarely see someone who's looking and trying to improve each and every day, and not just in sports, but as a parent, as a husband. I am inspired by what he's done and what he shared with Vanessa and what he's shared with his kids. I have a daughter who is 30 who just um, became a grandparent. And I have two twins. I have twins at six. I can't wait to get home to become a girl dad and to hug them and to see the love that they, and the smiles that they bring to us as parents. He taught me that just by looking at this tonight, looking at how he responded and reacted with the people they actually loved. These are the things that we will continue to learn from Kobe Bryant. To Vanessa, Natalia, Bianca, Capri, my wife and I will keep you close in our hearts and our prayers. We will always be here for you, always. I also want to offer our condolences and support to all the families affected by this enormous tragedy. Kobe gave every last ounce of himself to whatever he was doing. After basketball, he showed a creative side to himself that I didn't think any of us knew he had. In retirement, he seemed so happy. He found new passions, and he continued to give back as a coach in his community. More importantly, he was an amazing dad, amazing husband, who dedicated himself to his family and who loved his daughters with all his heart. Kobe never left anything on the court. And I think that's what he would want for us to do. No one knows how much time we have. That's why we must live in the moment. We must enjoy the moment. We must reach and see and spend as much time as we can with our families and friends and the people that we absolutely love. To live in the moment means to enjoy each and every one that we come in contact with. When Kobe Bryant died, a piece of me died. And as I look in this arena and across the globe, a piece of you died, or else you wouldn't be here. Those are the memories that we have to live with and we learn from. I promise you, from this day forward, I will live with the memories of knowing that I had a little brother that I tried to help in every way I could. Please, rest in peace, little brother. There have been many great in the history of the NBA, but none better or more fun to follow than Kobe and Shaq.
They won three titles in a row together with their teammates for the city of Los Angeles. And their names will be linked for all time. Please welcome Shaquille O'Neal. speaking to a group of people about Kobe Bryant, a picture in the context of his Hall of Fame induction, or as a guest speaker at one of Kobe Vanessa's foundation event. But never ever could I have imagined that I'd be here today. We have been watching a celebration of life, the Kobe and Gianna Bryant Memorial here at the Staples Center in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, there seems to be a small technical difficulty with the feed coming in, but we've just been witnessing some incredible moments. It sounds like the feed has just come back. Let's go back inside. Shaquille O'Neal now speaking. The greatest basketball of all time, and I am proud that no other team has accomplished what the three-peat Lakers have done since Shaq and the Kobe Lakers did it. And yes, yeah, sometimes like immature kids, we argued, we fought, we bannered or insulted each other with offhand remarks, our feud. But make no mistake, even when the folks thought we were on bad terms, when the cameras were turned off, he and I would throw a wink at each other and say, let's go whoop some ass. We never took it seriously. In truth, Kobe and I always maintained a deep respect and a love for one another. The day I gained, the day Kobe gained my respect was the guys were complaining. I said, Shaq, Kobe's not passing the ball. I said, I'll talk to him. I said, Kobe, there's no I in team. And Kobe said, I know, but there's an Indian. <laughs> so I went back. <laughs> So I went back and told Rick and, uh, and Big Shot Bob, I said, just get the rebound. He's not passing. <laughs> Mamba, you were taken away from us way too soon. Your next chapter of life was just beginning. But now it's time for us to continue your legacy. You said yourself that everything negative, pressure, challenges, is all an opportunity for me to rise. So we now take that sage advice to now rise from anguish and begin with the healing. Just know that we got your back, little brother. I'll look after things down here. I'll be sure to teach Natalia, Bianca, and Baby Capri all your moves, and I promise I will not teach them my free throw techniques. <laughs> <clears throat> but for now, I take comfort in the fact that as we speak, Kobe and Gigi are holding hands, walking to the nearest basketball court. Kobe will show her some new mama moves today, and Gigi soon masters them. Kobe, your heaven's MVP, I love you, my man, till we meet again. Rest in peace, Kobe.
you so much for tonight. Um, but you know, it's not. You know, it's, it's not about um, my jerseys that are hanging up there for me. You know, it's about the jerseys that were hanging up there before. Um, you know, without them, I couldn't be here today. They inspired me to play the game at a high level. And it's also uh, about the next generation, embodying the spirit that exists in those jerseys up there and carrying this organization forward so that the next 20 years are better than the past 20 years. And that's what it's about. And then it's also about the fans. Fans. Um, And uh, it's about family. It's about my wife, Vanessa. <laughs> you know, you guys don't know this, but the last game, my last game uh, that we had here against the Utah Jazz, I was really tired. I got home and I was like, you know what? I don't know if I can do this thing. Um, I got one more game left, but I don't have any legs. And she said, I want to show you something. I got a gift for you for your last game. And uh, she proceeded to show me a row of retired jerseys from Baylor, from Magic, from Shaq, from Cap, all with personal messages signed to me, including from Michael Jordan, including from the great Bill Russell, including from the great Larry Bird. And when I saw that, I knew then that I had to turn it up. I had to turn it up. So thank you, baby, for being an inspiration to me. And, uh, and lastly, our daughters, Natalia, Gianna, and Bianca. Um, you know, I, 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 I hope that tonight is not, you know, you, you guys know that, you know, if you do the work, you work hard enough, dreams come true. Thank you guys so much. I love you. And, uh, Mamba out. Gentlemen, please welcome six-time Grammy Award winner, Christina Aguilera.
Christina Aguilera. Thank, Thank you, you Christina. Thanks. That was beautiful. And in Italian as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love Thank it. you. Kobe, as you know, had big plans after basketball. He had many interests. Uh, one of them was film. Uh, one of them was the Mamba and Mambasita Foundation. Um, he published books, but he wanted to make movies. He a movie, and of course, because he is Kobe Bryant, the first movie he made won an Oscar. <laughs> and this is Kobe's Academy Award winning film called Dear Basketball. basketball. From the moment I started rolling my dad's tube socks and shooting imaginary game-winning shots in the Great Western Forum, I knew one thing was real. I fell in love with you. A love so deep, I gave you my all. From my mind and body, to my spirit and soul. As a six-year-old boy, I'm deeply in love with you. I never saw the end of the tunnel. I only saw myself running out of one. And so I ran. I ran up and down every court after every loose ball for you. You asked for my hustle. I gave you my heart. Because it came with so much more. I played through the sweat and the hurt. Not because challenge called me. But because you called me. I did everything for you. Because that's what you do when someone makes you feel as alive as you've made me feel. You gave a six-year-old boy his Laker dream. And I'll always love you for it. But I can't love you obsessively for much longer. This season is all I have left to give. My heart can take the pounding. My mind can handle the grind. But my body knows it's time to say goodbye. And that's okay. I'm ready to let you go. I want you to know now so we both can savor every moment we have left together. The good and the bad. We have given each other all that we have. And we both know no matter what I do next, I'll always be that kid with the rolled up socks, garbage can in the corner, Five seconds on the clock, ball in my hands. Five, four, three, two, one.
Well, there you have it. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. We love you. We love your kids. We will pray for you and for the Chester, Altabelli, Sobayan, and Mauser families. Please support the Mamba on Three Fund. Please support the Mamba and Mamba Sita Sports Foundation. It's what Kobe and Gigi would have wanted. Thank you for coming. And don't forget, work hard and hug the people you love. Good afternoon, everyone. His name echoing through the Staples Center one more time. An incredible ceremony honoring an incredible life. At times there were moments that you couldn't help but cry, at other times there were moments you couldn't help but laugh. And the mama mentality, what Kobe Bryant called sort of his inner spirit when he would turn it on here in the Staples Center in the middle of a basketball game we saw with his wife, Vanessa Bryant, taking to the stage, honoring her daughter and her husband, the courage it took to speak. Here's just one moment from her eulogy that was so powerful. God knew they couldn't be on this earth without each other. He had to bring them home to heaven together. Babe, you take care of our Gigi. And I got Nani, Bibi, and Coco. We're still the best team. We love and miss you, Boo Boo and Gigi. May you both rest in peace and have fun in heaven until we meet again one day. We love you both and miss you forever and always. Mommy. Vanessa Bryant there saying goodbye to both her daughter and her, sus her husband, calling him an MVD, the most valuable dad. I want to bring in Kena Whitworth, one of my colleagues from ABC News. And Kena, we were watching this together live. And, and as parents, as, as people who watched Kobe Bryant play, it, it was just so amazing to see the courage it took for her to go up there. And her words were so powerful. I agree. Remember, we didn't know if she was going to even be there. And so for her to stand up and for her to talk and for her to share some of those really poignant memories. I know for me, at least now, I envision Gigi doing some of those things that made her happy. She told the story about Gigi lapping her on a track despite her giving her the head start. I thought those memories were really important and I thought the way she delivered them with such strength in a packed Staples Center it had to make everybody's heart feel a little bit at ease while it breaks for her at the same time. Um, because you know you're going, she's going home to take care of her team, like she said. Uh, that was that was really hard. And I just think she was so honest. You know, she called uh, her and Kobe's relationship perfect, perfectly imperfect people. Yeah. And it, it was really something probably anybody can relate to. And she was just so down to earth about how Kobe treated her, how, how he, he was as a husband to her on Valentine's Day, on their anniversaries. Uh, talking about him as a father and talking about her daughter in those special moments. But again, it, we, we can't say it enough. It was truly incredible to see her take that stage and sort of command the Staples Center and, and show the respect that Kobe and, and, and his daughter deserved. I, I agree. And when you say it was sort of like they were a, a normal couple, right? They tried to paint that picture, which yeah. they are, but they also weren't. Right. You know, they were also celebrities yeah. and beloved by everyone in Los Angeles. And when she told the story about how he brought her home, the props from the movie. Right. The notebook, the blue dress, because that was the kind of man he was. He really had a soft spot, I think, that maybe a lot of us didn't quite know about uh, until today. Even though you see that in his interactions with his daughters, when you hear Vanessa talk about it, you really get a glimpse into what their life was like and what their marriage was like. It, it was incredible. There, there were also some moments that, that we couldn't stop laughing. Moments yeah. with Shaquille O'Neal and, of course, with Michael Jordan, one of the greatest players, maybe the greatest player to ever play the game. Kobe picked up for him right after... Uh, Michael finished his career, and, and he had some words both funny and touching for Kobe Bryant. Oh, he's got me. I'll have to look at another crime meme for the next... <laughs> we
when Kobe Bryant died, a piece of me died. And as I look in this arena and across the globe, a piece of you died, or else you wouldn't be here. Those are the memories that we have to live with and we learn from. I promise you, from this day forward, I will live with the memories of knowing that I had a little brother that I tried to help in every way I could. Please, rest in peace, little brother. Rest in peace to Kobe Bryant and to all those people who died in that horrific helicopter crash. Just behind me, you can see the crowd. You can hear them cheering for Kobe Bryant. Nearly everyone in some type of Kobe Bryant jersey, wearing the number eight, wearing the number 24. Uh, this was a celebration of his life, and this really was a celebration that we witnessed over the last two hours. So many fans out here, so happy. All the proceeds of this going to the Mamba and Mamba Sita Foundation. We thank you for watching ABC News Live today, our coverage of a celebration of life. Life, remembering Kobe and Gianna Bryan. I'm Tom Yamas at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. We leave you now with a few moments from today's incredibly moving ceremony. celebration of life for Kobe and Gianna Bryant and their friends John, Carrie and Alyssa Altabelli, Sarah and Peyton Chester, Christina Mauser and Ara Zabayan. My baby girl. He was a beautiful, kind, happy, silly, thoughtful and loving daughter and sister. She was so full of life and had so much more to offer this world. In the end, she was a sun just starting to rise, and God did she glow. Gigi would have most likely become the best player in the WNBA. She would have made a huge difference. I miss you, all of you, every day. I love you. Now for my soulmate. I was his VB, his principessa, his reina, his queen mama, mamba, and his viski, maniski, fabuliski. He always told the girls how beautiful and smart they are. He taught them how to be brave and how to keep pushing forward when things get tough. With Kobe and Gigi's moonlight, we will never have to live in the darkness of night again. We will all journey on until one day we will be in heaven together again, and this time, it will be forever. I love you, dear Kobe and precious Gigi. God knew they couldn't be on this earth without each other. He had to bring them home to heaven together. Babe, you take care of our Gigi. And I got Nani, Bibi, and Coco. We're still the best team. We love and miss you, Boo Boo and Gigi. May you both rest in peace and have fun in heaven until we meet again one day. We love you both and miss you forever and always. Mommy. You guys will always be in my heart. I sincerely, sincerely appreciate it. No words can describe how I feel about you guys. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I, God, I love you guys. Good morning, and welcome to the celebration of life for Kobe and Gianna Bryant and their friends, John, Carrie, and Alyssa Altabelli, Sarah and Peyton Chester, Christina Mauser, and Ara Zabayan. On behalf of Vanessa and the entire Bryant family, we thank you for your thoughts and prayers during